public hearing of the Committee of Public Safety regarding resolutions number 200397 and bill number 200538. Before we get started, I'd like to recognize Ms. Samantha Williams Esquire, who will read the required statement for the record. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I understand that state law currently requires that the following announcement be made at the beginning of every remote public hearing as follows. Due to the current public health emergency, city council committees are currently meeting remotely. We're using Microsoft Teams to make these remote hearings possible. Instructions for how the public may view and offer public testimony at public hearings of city council are included in the public hearing notices that are published in the daily news, inquire and legal intelligencer prior to the hearing and can also be found on phlcouncil.com. Everyone who has been invited to participate in this meeting or to testify should be aware that the public hearing is being recorded. Because this hearing is being recorded, participants and viewers have no reasonable expectation of privacy. By continuing to be in this meeting, you are consenting to being recorded. Additionally, prior to Councilman Jones recognizing members for questions or comments they have for witnesses, I will note for the record at this time that we will use the chat feature available in Microsoft Teams to allow members to signify that they wish to be recognized. In order to comply with the Sunshine Act, the chat feature must only be used for this purpose. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Williams. And at this time, can we take the role to establish a quorum and will members upon being recognized, say a few words so that we can capture your image for channel 64. Council member Thomas. Council member Thomas. Oh, I'm sorry, I was on mute. Good morning, uh, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, colleagues. Good morning to the administration. Um, and I'm present. I apologize for that. Good clarity. morning. Council Member Green. Present. Council Member Gautier. Present. Good morning, everyone. Council Member Gim. Good morning, everybody. Present. I'm present. Vice Chairman Johnson. and Chairman Jones. Present and accounted for, thank you, Ms. Williams. Uh, a quorum has been established and is present. Um, and this hearing is now called to order. Uh, will you now please read the titles of the resolution and the bills? Resolution number 200397, a resolution authorizing the City Council Committee on Public Safety to hold hearings to review the city's response to protests in support of ending systematic racism in policing and of the Black Lives Matter movement and to provide residents with a forum to share their experiences and make recommendations for safer and non-discriminatory policing. And bill number 200538, an ordinance amending Title 10 of the Philadelphia Code to create a new chapter, Chapter 10, 2500, entitled Less Lethal Devices, to regulate the use of less lethal devices in specific situations, all under certain terms and conditions. Thank you, Ms. Williams. I just wanna say, before I recognize the sponsor of the resolution and bills, uh, that we've had a listening session prior to this, and it was designed to hear from those people, both at 52nd and uh, Market and Walnut, and also those who uh, experienced um, police interactions on I-76. I uh, I think that might have been a four hour listening session where there was riveting testimony about uh, the impact of how police community interactions occur. This part of the hearing will be designed to listen to the administration and lessons learned uh, about those two interactions and how we can go forward um, in the future to have better reaction uh, to both protests and um, unfortunately uh, interactions with rioting. So with that, I wanna recognize member Gim 
uh, for comments about the resolution and the bill. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for being on, you know, just a critically important partner in all of the work as we uh, partner with the administration, with our commissioner um, to to rethink public safety and work towards transforming our institutions. Um, so two weeks ago, as as the chairman said, this committee heard powerful testimony from dozens of witnesses who described the chaos, terror, and pain of the events of late May and early June, when tens of thousands of people marched through our city to demand a better tomorrow, and were met with a show of force that had not been deployed in our city in decades. Some of the comments that were said, every day I wake up in the morning and I'm there again, said public school teacher Max Hibbard. I'm surrounded by police officers shooting pepper spray at innocent people and launching tear gas into our lungs. Monica Allison, a longtime resident of Cobbs Creek said, tanks and tear gas do not belong in residential areas and it is an offensive outrage that I even need to come here to tell you that. Our young people are watching. 16 year old Kawia Powers, a high school junior said police are supposed to protect us. I could feel the man's pain when the police hit him. It felt like we were the ones getting hit. And Benji Jonti, who said that he was shot with rubber bullets, pepper sprayed, beaten, and had racial slurs hurled at him, said at the end of the day, I'm a black man in America and I fear for my children. These are just a few of the excerpts from the nearly three hour public listening session that centered the voices of residents and Philadelphians. The telling of these experiences was extremely hard. It took a lot of time to, uh, to work with folks to come forward. Every single person who stepped forward to speak, to have been interviewed by us, submitted written testimony or engaged with city council throughout the last few months has done so at great personal difficulty and with a lot of pain. The trauma stays with many of them today. But their telling was also a profound public service and a challenge to us as a council body to remember what is at stake when residents who have been subjected to force come to their elected officials to demand better. We have to understand how powerful these moments are. They're not isolated moments in time. They're a narrative of people's lived experiences with systemic racism, with policing of their communities, and with the sense that people's safety and confidence in our institutions is not improving. So today it's our turn to listen to the administration to help make the record clear and fuller, to reflect on lessons learned as the council chairman said, and to come together to ensure that the voices of Max Hibbard, Monica Allison, Kawia Powers, Beji Jonti, and so many others have been truly heard. Our city must heal. And this healing requires us to look deeply into our actions, practices, expectations, as much as we review our policies. A clarification to the viewing public. While there are a number of ongoing investigations, this isn't one of them. City Council has the responsibility to hold a public forum, to hold city agencies and officials accountable to consider public policy and to elevate the voices of residents. That is what this process is. We chose a public process of listening, of truth telling, of accountability driven by the voices and experiences of the people we serve. This is a moment where repairing trust between our residents, public officials, and our police officers is essential. That begins with council opening up its now virtual doors and being beginning the starting point for tough conversations that talk about accountability and truth telling. I want to thank the public safety uh, committee members, my colleagues for their incredible partnership over these past few weeks. Um, I want to thank the administration and especially Commissioner Outlaw for your willingness in answering some of today's tough questions and for being a partner with us as we try to figure out a path forward. Most of all, I want to thank the hundreds of Philadelphians who have been willing to share their stories during this process. Your voices do not fall on deaf ears. They are the key for us as we strive to do better, to be fair, to heal, and to rebuild. Thank you very much. Thank Dr. you. Cameron. Thank you, Member Dim. Only when you're ready to listen can you be ready to lead. And I thank you for putting 
forth this important resolution and important legislation. Are there any other members of the committee who would like to give opening remarks? Ms. Guigam, anyone in the chat feature without any other remarks? Let's move to hear from the first uh, panel to testify. Can you bring them up? Yes, the first panel to testify uh, will be Police Commissioner Danielle Outlaw, accompanied by Managing Director Tumar Alexander um, for questions. Good morning, Commissioner. Good morning, Managing Director. Um, can you can you make sure we have a good mic? Say, say good morning. Or... Good morning. Good morning, sir. Got it. All right, state your name and please begin your testimony. Good morning, Chairperson Jones and other members of the Committee on Public Safety. My name is Danielle Outlaw and I am the Philadelphia Police Commissioner. I'm here today um, with the usual crew, our executive team here. Um, thank you very much for allowing me to provide testimony today for resolution number 200397. Please let me state at the outset that racism, discrimination, and hate have absolutely no place in the Philadelphia Police Department. When it has been identified and proven, the Philadelphia Police Department has taken unprecedented action to permanently remove those officers from the ranks of the Philadelphia Police Department. That said, I understand that this committee has questions regarding the actions of the department during the George Floyd protests and riots. I will be as open and as transparent uh, with any questions presented, but I must state up front, based upon open litigation and after consulting with the law department, I am not at liberty to discuss the specifics of any individuals or events that occur during the Floyd protests and riots. Nonetheless, I will submit any uh, specific requests you may have directly to the law department so that they can follow up directly with you in writing. So before we begin, uh, for those who may not be aware, please allow me the opportunity to explain in detail the monumental efforts that have been completed or are pending in the police department since the Floyd protests and riots. We have taken a very deep dive and we have found deficiencies that needed to be addressed to restore the faith and trust in the department, along with proactive member, uh, measures to help foster a sense of reconciliation within the communities that we serve. First, let me discuss the policy changes that have already been implemented since May. All use of force notifications must now be provided over police radio in addition to the existing reporting requirements laid out in the directive. Additionally, no-knock entry of all warrants are now prohibited in the uh, police department. All exculpatory information or information that would contradict a person's involvement in a crime is now required to be included in affidavits submitted to magistrates for approval. The intentional pointing of a firearm at an individual is also now considered a use of force and must be recorded using the departmental use of force form. The department's use of force policy was updated to clearly articulate that kneeling on someone's head or neck is prohibited. This is consistent with recent city council amendments. Now, please allow me to identify the projects that are currently underway. First, the PPD is working collaboratively with the Police Advisory Commission to evaluate the Police Board of Inquiry, or PBI, as you might hear us refer it to, to review its disciplinary processes. The PAC, PPD, PBI, uh, PBI Action Plan was signed in August of 2020 and is expected to be completed in February of 2021. Additionally, all SWAT Less Than Lethal Standard Operating Procedures, SOPs, are in the process of being amended to include references to the sanctity of life and rights of peaceful protesters consistent with overall departmental policy. The law department has also been included in reviewing these amendments. All of the department's use of force policies were reviewed against the Police Executive Research Forum Report, which is the 30 guiding principles on use of force. Edits to policy and PPD mission have been drafted by the executive team and are being staffed to all commanders for additional comments or edits before final consideration. As you may have re uh, uh, recently heard in the media, the department has begun the process of implementing a co-responder or alternate response model with the Department of Behavioral Health 
and intellectual disabilities by embedding a mental health clinician into police radio. That first step began on September 28, 2020. With respect to recruitment, the PPD has started the process, the hiring process and actively recruiting for a diversity and inclusion officer focused on equity and organizational excellence. The hiring process is expected to be completed in November. And continuing on with organizational excellence, the PPD will train its personnel, both officers and non-sworn and implicit bias with Dr. Marks uh, starting the training on October 28th. And we hope to conclude the entire training in the fall of 2021. I am also very proud that the PPD will be an early adopter of the Active Bystander for Law Enforcement Program, ABLE, and will train all sworn personnel how to actively and effectively intervene when other officers are acting inappropriately. Phase one of this project implementation has um, PPD training for academy instructors through the National ABLE Train the Trainer session which began last month in September, and additional personnel will be trained in November 2020 to support the additional phases of the larger project implementation and kick off slated in early January 2021. With respect to technical assistance requests, we have initiated the following. The PPD has requested and actually been approved for um, no cost technical assistance from the Bureau of Justice Assistance, National Training and Technical Assistance Center, to conduct a comprehensive review of the current PPD officer safety and wellness efforts focused on identifying current assets within PPD, as well as gaps to support sworn personnel and to extend the program to non-sworn personnel. This work is expected to begin in November of this year. As it relates to our recruitment and retention efforts, the PPD has requested and received approval for no cost technical assistance from the International Association of Chiefs of Police Collaborative Reform Technical Assistance Center, or FRITAC, to conduct a comprehensive review of our recruitment and retention efforts focused on creating a roadmap for increased success in, attractive, in attracting diverse individuals amongst our rank and file. This work will begin in November of 2020. As it relates to our technology, we have partnered with the NYU Policing Project, who's begun a review of all of our electronic surveillance uh, policy as it relates to uh, all of the technology and software that we have. They've begun a review of our uh, PPD surveillance and information gathering technology policies, and they're looking at it from a civil rights, civil liberties perspective. This review will complement any current policy work as well as be incorporated into our future efforts. And we hope for that review to be completed by the end of this fall or by fall 2020. In addition to um, what the policing project is doing, we've asked PAC, uh, the Quattrone Center for the Fair Administration of Justice and a prominent civil rights attorney to review our policy as it relates to our facial recognition policy. Um, this is important because again, when it comes to electronic surveillance, we know that the uh, technology that we use whether intended or unintended could have more harmful uh, consequences than um, we initially set out um, in set out for in utilizing these these technologies. And we want to make sure that we're not rolling out technology in front of policy, but that it's done through an equity lens as well. Uh, this work is ongoing, and once concluded, um, agreed upon recommendations will be incorporated into our policy. In addition to our uh, work with PAC, we're also making sure that we work very closely with the GBI initiative um, and the recommendations that they put forth and making sure that we utilize our seat at the table on the advisory commission uh, or the advisory committee to make sure again that all of our strategies are looked at through an equity lens. So all of that to say, uh, I know I'm leaving out a lot of things as well in addition to a civilianization study that we're looking at. And then we're also working with the city to do a process study to really take a deep dive into types of calls that we are responding to to determine whether or not the police department are being uh, called or 911 is being called over being tasked for responsibilities that should be dealt out elsewhere. There's a lot of things going on and they've been going on well uh, before uh, the end of May, early June. So a lot of great changes have already occurred in the PD 
uh, will be and also will be appearing in the very near future. It's been a team effort with an extraordinary amount of time and effort to accomplish these goals in such a short period of time. And I know I spoke of a lot of things, um, but I'd be happy and my team would be happy to answer any additional questions that the committee may have in regards to these changes or our additional plans in the future. Um, but again, thank you for the opportunity to be heard and I, I look forward to being able to assist in a collaborative way moving forward. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, before I go to um, Member Gim and before that, uh, Member Gardier, just one question. Take us back to the, those days. And I, my question would be, we dealt with protesters before in the history of this city, whether we're talking about most recently Occupy and other uh, protesters. How was the death of George Floyd and, and the protests that occurred after that, how did that kind of contribute to the way we responded on those two occasions at 52nd Street and on um, I-76. Was there anything that kind of uh, made us operate and respond differently? Yeah, so, you know, I would say that the, the protests and demonstrations and subsequently some of the looting and the rioting that we've seen and the level of violence was a lot different than any of us have seen before, whether here in Philadelphia or in my previous assignments and previous roles in other parts of the country. Um, I will say because of that, um, even though we saw, even up to the night before, I think it was Atlanta was experiencing what they were experiencing, um, the tone and tenor wasn't set early on. The level of planning that went into it, meaning the number of resources and personnel that we have had available at the onset um, wasn't bolstered until later on, until subsequent days. And it was because I don't believe that we were expecting, and I say we in the royal sense, we were expecting in the city the level of, um, I would say, demonstrations that we experienced, uh, whether it was the frequency whether it was the uh, the variance in locations that were, you know, they were occurring simultaneously throughout the city. And then also the level of violence that we were seeing later on in subsequent days. So I will say on the front end, the level of planning that we know now should have taken place uh, prior to this did not happen because historically, these types of demonstrations just have not occurred. One again, with the level of violence that we were seeing later, um, with the resources being depleted and diluted uh, throughout the city because there wasn't one centralized focus location in the city. And then um, through, you know, I will also say protesters have adapted over time and police are now having to adapt with the tactics that we're seeing. And again, we're not seeing places centralized, demonstration centralized in one place, downtown, for example, there isn't one hotspot. This stuff can pop up all over the city. And now moving forward, we know that planning wise, we have to ensure that we have resources not only available to address what we think might be happening as far as a planned event, but we also have to have resources available uh, throughout the city in order to address anything that might happen uh, as it relates to that. Um, I can give you more insight on that, but the, the long and the short of it, I, I think that's the answer to that question. So if I read through what you just said, there was no playbook that you could draw from that could adequately deal with the level of sequence, not necessarily what happened on I-76 or at 52nd Street, but there was no general playbook that you could draw from. And we, in these hearings, thanks to a member Gim, are gonna kind of edit our existing playbook going forward. Yeah, and, and I would say to be very clear, we work off of intelligence. We, when we plan, we work from intelligence. We work off of what's happened in the past. Um, and there was no specific intelligence, uh, specific to Philadelphia, I should say. We all knew what was happening in other parts of the country, but even the level of 
unrest that we saw here in Philadelphia from the folks, you know, I, I had only been here a few months at the time, um, but still no one that I'd spoken to historically had dealt with the level or the types of, and the variances of civil unrest uh, that were occurring that began on the 31st and the subsequent days. So again, no, there is no playbook. There's no reference. However, I will say, you know, generally speaking, when you, um, you know, we can plan for uh, large numbers. We can plan to set tone in advance. We can plan to have adequate resources or what we deem adequate resources. We can cancel days off. We can extend shifts. We can lean forward with mutual aid requests to give us sheer numbers, right? Um, but again, there was no intelligence at that time uh, to let us know basically what we would experience um, the 31st on. Thank you. Member Gaudier? You're on mute. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, good morning, Commissioner Outlaw. Good morning. Um, I would like to follow up on Council Member Jones's line of questioning. Um, approximately 93% of both Cobbs Creek and Haddington residents are Black, and 52nd Street has historically served as a vibrant community full of Black political leaders and community organizers, and presently remains a critical historic um, center of Black heritage. What will the administration do to ensure that such disproportionate force does not continue to be deployed on overwhelmingly black neighborhoods in the future. Thank you for your question. I want to be very clear in that disproportion, disproportional force, uses of force, is not appropriate under any circumstance, regardless of the neighborhood um, or any community. All force has to be necessary and reasonable and proportionate. Uh, with that said, I just want to quote directly from the directive 10.2, which is our use of modified or limited force. Um, our directive very clearly states that the primary duty of all police officers is to preserve human life. Only the amount of force necessary to protect life or to effect an arrest should be used by an officer. Excessive force will not be tolerated. Officers should exercise all safe and reasonable means of control and containment, using only the minimal amount of force necessary to overcome resistance. The application of force by a police officer should be guided by principles found in the following, that we have a use of force decision chart and the provisions of chapter five of the Pennsylvania's Crimes Code, state and federal court decisions and other statutory provisions. I share that because it is my expectation, regardless of community, that we follow our directives. Uh, again, understanding you know, that there are specifically in these incidences, there were neighborhoods that were impacted more than others, uh, you know, but I want to be very clear in that, but, you know, disproportionate use of force is not to be tolerate, tolerated anywhere. So moving forward, very clear expectations and communications of our directives and guidelines, which is, has been done uh, and will continue to be done and ensuring that proper oversight and systems of accountability are being used. I would like to hear um, the managing director weigh in on that as well. Good morning, Councilwoman. Um, as the commissioner said, we agree. Uh, we, we, you know, from the managing director's office and from the administration's point of view, we uh, wholeheartedly agree with the commissioner and, and that particular issue as it re relates to use of force. Thank you for that response. I think what you know, and I know you all have after action reviews going on and um, and and that that will inform a lot of what happens in the future. I think what I'm also asking for beyond you know hearing um, a, a sort of policy stated that uh, is is supposed to be one size fits all for the city. I think I'm looking for an acknowledgement um, of of place. Um, you know, West Philly has a history um, with the Philadelphia Police Department. It is a terrible and harsh history. Um, it is a history um, rooted in racism. And so beyond sort of uh, hearing your policy stated, I want, and it, it, I think the, I would love to see the police department interact as if they understand the history of these neighborhoods. 
And, and I think we need that more than we need um, a blanket policy um, that hasn't even been applied um, in, a, in a routine way. And so that's what I'm, I'm looking for um, as we come out of this. And, and I think that's fair. I think that's a very clear, uh, fair uh, statement that you make. I give you and I recite the policy because I want to be very clear on what expectations are. So why it might be blanket, again, it applies to why. With that said, the reason why I took the time to kind of list out some of the other things that are underway, um, there are a lot of efforts underway that contribute to what you're talking about that lead to this acknowledgement. And I think there are a lot of assumptions made, um, but training is a huge piece of this, right? So when we talk about rolling out implicit bias, when we talk about looking at our, our processes for who we hire, who we recruit, who we train, who we market to, uh, how we retain folks, hiring a diversity and inclusion officer, ensuring that we do everything through an equity lens strategically, right, before we roll out any plan, that's what we're talking about here, is ensuring that those folks that we hire, when they're in the academy, right, they know the neighborhoods, they know the history of the neighborhoods. It's ensuring that who we promote, who we put in positions of influence, our field training officers, that as they're out in these neighborhoods, they're also reinforcing and teaching the history of these neighborhoods because a lot of the you know some stuff you just can't put in a policy right and so that's why a lot of these efforts are lending towards what the things that you're talking about so policy is very important because it's a guide our guiding documents but all of our effort other efforts are going to lend towards i think not only the empathy and understanding but allowing folks to step back and say if i do this in this particular neighborhood here are some of the potential implications or impacts that it may have in the long term. Thank you. Yeah. My second question, um, why was the response to vigilantes in Fishtown and surrounding Marconi Plaza in South Philadelphia handled in the way that it was? Um, according to Philadelphia Police Department directives and policy, what is the appropriate response to individuals wielding baseball bats and other weaponry in residential neighborhoods? So thank you for your question around Fishtown. And I think that also goes back to the question that you just asked, right? Understanding that there has been a history in these particular neighborhoods between residents uh, and some of the actions in the past. I, I do wanna acknowledge that again, um, our impacts, uh, uh, the impact felt from our response, whether some people agree or disagree, it, it had an impact, right? And I want to acknowledge that. But I also know that there was a lot of misinformation that was put out there um, regarding um, our response. And I, I want to be clear before I turn it over to Deputy Commissioner Nash to give an update on the arrests that were made and the cases that were open. Um, I want to be clear in that merely carrying a bat is not a crime. There has to be an action or threats or something in, uh, along with that uh, in order for that to be a crime. Um, there has to be brandishing or threatening behavior. And it's the same thing. Um, and we've had a lot of conversations, Council Member Brooks, I see your facial expression. We've had a lot of conver conversations with the DA uh, around this as well. Um, it's important to remember that we focus on behaviors and not people or ideologies. I wanna be clear on that. Um, I think we needed to do better around education around warrantless arrests and going into the elections, I think we need to do the same thing. Uh, what happens when crimes occur and it's not in our presence, um, what the process is around that. But Commissioner Nash, do you want to chime in and just let folks know what did happen around there? And I will say specifically, um, and they're not on this call, so I, I don't want to put words into their mouth. The leadership at that district in a community meeting made very clear that in hindsight, they wish they would have handled that situation differently uh, and how they utilized uh, the officers deployed there and just the interactions, understanding again, the impact that it had on the community there. Uh, Commissioner Nash, do you wanna jump in yes. on this? Good morning. Good morning, council. Good morning, commissioner. Um, as noted by the commissioner, we are, responding to a situation where there are actions that we can take based on events occurring in our presence and there are actions that we have to do an investigation and conduct an investigation and obtain a warrant for an arrest. And 
relating to the incident in Fishtown, the incidents in Fishtown, uh, we were alerted to an assault that occurred, um, and it involved a individual who identified himself as a reporter. Um, and when that incident was in investigated, uh, we did receive a tip. We made an arrest of an individual. Uh, the, the incident occurred on, on, on the 1st of June. Um, the warrant was obtained on the 24th of June, and the individual was arrested for the assault on the individual plus um, threats and a simple assault against his girlfriend. As, a, as relative to the events that occurred on that day as well, um, there was another, uh, there, were, there was another uh, claim of, of a assault that occurred. Um, that individual was, it, it was investigated, the report was investigated, and we were unable to, um, that individual was unable to make an identification. In fact, he identified somebody that was put into a photo array, so we were not able to identify anybody for that assault. Um, and all of the information that came forward to the police department that was reported was thoroughly investigated by the detective divisions. But to this date, the one individual that was uh, arrested, he is pending a, a preliminary hearing. So that is a case that is in progress and really not much more we can talk about that. There were other allegations that were made in the media um, about individuals that were responsible for crimes. Um, we investigated everything thoroughly as we could and were not able to make any additional arrests. So as the commissioner noted, just the fact that somebody is wielding a bat um, does not mean that they are subject to an arrest at the time. Um, and we investigated everything that we could. Uh, so that's where we stand. And while the response may not have made everybody happy, I think it's, it's important to take the whole incident in perspective as to what was going on. It was, it was early in the protest days. And the police objective was really to maintain peace as best as possible. There was, we tried to maintain, and we, I believe we did maintain an impartiality as best as possible. Um, we were trying to de-escalate everything possibly. And so we weren't out there creating more problems um, by arresting people left and right. We were also outnumbered, and I think that's important to keep in mind. So I think the actions, as we look back on them, maybe they weren't all the best actions that could have been taken. There are, there are mistakes that were made throughout this process, but we did everything um, with the idea of, of fairness and impartiality. And I think we'll always continue to try and do better. Thank you. Without respect, I saw videos from both of those incidents. Um, the people wielding the bats were plenty aggressive. They were plenty aggressive. They were plenty threatening. And I would argue going back, and, and not only that, um, the, cop, the police response um, was more, um, there was a sense of, there were slapping high fives, right? There was a sense that these people were friends. And so I would argue going back to sort of our previous line of discussion, um, that the response in, um, Fishtown in South Philly is as based on the history of the police department with the people in those neighborhoods as the response in 52nd street was based on the history of the police department and the relationship of the police department to the people who live in West Philly. And this is why I say that, um, I understand that we have policies, but it's not enough to have policies. Um, we need to have real um, sort of restoration of relationships and a real understanding of um, what of the history of these neighborhoods relationship to the police. Um, if the police have felt as familiar with the people in my district as, as, as they do to the people in Fishtown and South Philly, if they had felt like these were their pals, I argue that the response would have been different. Thank you. Thank you, Member Gunn. You're right. I, I just want to say you're right. I don't have anything else to say on that. You're right. You're absolutely right. Council Member Jones, I have a point of information. Point of information recognized. Yes. Um, 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 Officer Nash, if you could restate what was the charges that the person was arrested for and when that occurred again. Sure. The original <clears throat> incident that where, where that was reported by the media, um, it was for an incident that occurred on June 1st at 9 o'clock. A 35-year-old white male made a report um, that he was assaulted in, in the 400 block of East Thompson Street by a group of males. Um, a, the second complaint that came forward was his girlfriend. Um, we the, the complainants were interviewed early in June, and we did receive a tip that identified an individual um, who was arrested. 
Um, the individual was identified through a photo array that both of the uh, victims, the complainants, were able to identify him. Uh, the warrant was obtained on June the 24th, and he was arrested on June the 25th um, from his address. The bail was initially set at $75,000. Um, he did post a bail, and the preliminary hearing, uh, there have been a number of delays because of delays with the COVID, uh, with the court process. So he is still subject to a preliminary hearing that's scheduled for later this month. And so what was the charge? This was the charge for the male that was beaten included aggravated assault, simple assault, uh, recklessly endangering related offenses. Uh, the charge on the female included the uh, simple assault um, and uh, threats. Uh, I, I, I'll pull up the the, 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 in fact, it, it involved simple assault, recklessly endangering another person, and criminal conspiracy. That was the charge that was lodged for the girlfriend. The individual that was assaulted, the charges included aggravated assault, criminal conspiracy, simple assault, and recklessly endangering another person. And there were no other charges or any other individuals um, charged with any offenses from that incident? No, there was supposed to have been a second individual that was involved. We've not been able to identify that individual. So far, that investigation remains active and open. We'll continue to investigate, and if we have any information to lead to the identity of the second individual, we would we would pursue that with and the charges with the district attorney's office by warrant. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Member Green. I believe uh, Member Brooks is next. Is that right, Ms. Williams? I believe Councilwoman Gam is next. I yield to your eyesight. <laughs> Member Gam. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, and I, I do want to just thank Council Member Gautier uh, for, I think, you know, her very uh, clear call about how different things felt. And if I could, you know, we spent a lot of the summer uh, walking um, through streets, meeting with people, uh, talking to them about experiences. Um, you know, I think part of the concern that we had around the way that there were things that were happening, uh, whether they were official or not, was more than the feeling that there was just a high fiving or you know a friendliness and a chumminess that went out to it, but some kind of strange conveyance about a sense of being deputized to some extent that they were carrying out what was indeed like a public service effort. Um, by surrounding statues or, you know, walking through streets as a, as a kind of a, almost like a, you know, a, a force, you know, I don't, I don't know how to describe it other than, you know, we, I saw it certainly as a vigilante group. Um, and so, you know, I, I think that there's something about that. And then in the meantime, I, I recall so clearly being uh, walking in West Philadelphia as we were talking to uh, folks and on 51st Street where uh, on 51st and Chestnut nearby where a number of tear gas canisters had went off and a gentleman who actually was um, what felt very strongly about police presence. He had been there for over 40 years. You know, the thing that he said was that um, he called out uh, as police officers were walking by. It wasn't, you know, like hyped up at that time. But he was angry that nobody acknowledged him, greeted him, asked him if he was okay. And he told us that he yelled out and said, why don't you, you're not even gonna say hello. You're not gonna say my name. I've been here for 40 years. And he said he doesn't normally react in that way because he's used to living in West Philadelphia. But, uh, you know, I hope that elements like that really come out in the differences and experiences. And I think as council member Gautier said, challenges us to think beyond just blanket policies. You said it very clearly, uh, Commissioner Outlaw. Um, you know, in fact, practice is policy. The way we practice something is the policy itself because otherwise there is no other way to, you know, create a policy. It can just exist on the books, but if no one practices it or if they practice it, um, in opposition to the policy, um, the practice actually becomes the policy itself. Um, my questions are a, a couple of them. One, I mean, one of the areas that I think it got gray around, and this is in part due to the bill that we're going to be hearing later, 
is this question of what is a when do you, when does something become a First Amendment freedom and when does it either uh, either not qualify or maybe a First Amendment freedom initially exercised evolves to something different. So I guess I would ask whether um, whether there's been training by the police department to strengthen its understanding and identifying of First Amendment activities and its distinctions. Uh, yes, so thank you for that question. I, and I will say just right off the bat, the moment um, something becomes violent or an incident becomes violent, it's no longer First Amendment, Amendment protected activity. I, I wanna be clear there. And how, how would you, I'm sorry, I don't want to interrupt, but how would you qualify language, threats, or anything like that? Does that, so I, how does it, that play in? I, I just want to go back. So overall, when we're talking about these incidences, we had 12 police vehicles that were set on fire or otherwise completely destroyed. Um, 72 police vehicles that were vandalized and had to be taken off the street. We had a total of 104 officers that were assaulted and injured. Um, and we know that officers were and commanders were subjected to acid, urine, bottles, ricks, rocks, bricks, large scale commercial grade fireworks. Um, they were either punched, kicked, struck with sticks. We had an officer run over by a vehicle and nearly died. Um, while we had another commander that was hit in a brick with a leg and required emergency surgery. Also another commander, um, you know, experienced a broken nose while out there there. And then we had hundreds of stores that were looted and destroyed throughout the city. That is not peaceful First Amendment activity, to be very clear. Um, but we also know that there are gray areas and training, again, moving forward, we have to be very clear. And when a scene like that, or the results that I just described, goes from chaotic and transitions to something where it's no longer chaotic, we can slow things down. I think that's a training area that's been identified there. Um, again, our processes, and. And I, I hope to say, you know, and I think since these events have occurred, we've all seen, we've been dealing with a very high frequency of protests and demonstrations or civil unrest, even as recently as um, Breonna Taylor. Uh, and then, you know, the following week, we saw thousands and thousands of people out there and we had intelligence where people had intentions to try to repeat what had been done before, but it didn't happen. So I think it's safe to say that we've immediately implemented a lot of lessons learned around what happened with those two incidences, whether it was the incidents in West Philly or up on the freeway, to ensure that our response adapts, you know, with the changing times, but making sure that we can readily identify when those situations transition from chaotic and violent to that of First Amendment peaceful or passive resistant. Um, made very clear, again, uh, you know, that uses of force had to be reported up, up over the air so we can go back and audit and make sure that use of force reports were done. But there are also radio quips that were being pushed out. And this wasn't just um, during these incidences. This is something that the Philadelphia Police Department had been doing long before. And I think, you know, the department has had a reputation of handling large scale events very well and been used as subject matter experts. But again, training is key constant radio quits, reminding folks of the Constitution and of what First Amendment activity is, and then also ensuring that there is very clear communication. I will also say something uh, that we reincorporated um, moving forward, making sure that there was clear communication internally to have a briefing before these events to go over commander's intent and you know what's expected and reminders of what First Amendment activity looks like before uh, they roll out and deploy in the streets and then also real time uh, debriefs once everything concludes. So uh, reinforcing training and law was a huge component of that. Um, one of the things I think that stood out from the testimony a couple weeks ago, I mean, you certainly heard when people were describing things, kind of the noise and chaos of, of uh, you know, of the events that were surrounding them. But I think what was notable uh, in a large part was that many of the witnesses said that they never heard from police officers before use of force was deployed. Um, and so has there been discussion or um, changes in policy that allow police officers to be able to communicate to the public 
when you know when something has clearly shifted or when this is no longer considered a demonstration um any individual who continues to pursue you know here but you know here are like ways for people to depart or voluntarily leave a situation or recognize that not everybody who is uh, in a large crowd is necessarily an enemy here and many of them um, are actually uh, you know looking for the police to to create a sense of like order in in the area and not to add to the chaos. I think that's a very good point to mention. So uh, when we give dispersal orders, it's in, there's a, a, a few factors that are required. One, um, we have to give, they have to be heard. And in looking back and speaking with some of our folks, we need to ensure that we have the equipment so that folks can actually hear the dispersal orders or the warning that's been given. Um, generally, that's what happens when we declare uh, a situation in unlawful assembly. Mm -hmm. The warning is given. It's, it's very standard language, uh, and it's repeated a minimum of three times. And it's given time in between each warning so that people have not only the opportunity to leave, but they know where to go, how to leave, um, and what happens if they don't. So we recognized um, that you know, as these, uh, you know, as my expectations, again, as my expect expected warnings were given, it's possible that everyone didn't hear it. Also, um, looking back, you know, when we talk about lessons learned, moving forward, you know, the city, through the city, through OEM, uh, we utilized a, a function to push out messages to remind folks, or one, to let folks know that, hey, there's a curfew in place. One, there's a curfew it's in place and here's the time. And if you're not inside by this time, here's what could happen. Moving forward, I would like to use the same technology um, to let folks know in real time, because a lot of this stuff, you don't know what's gonna happen or when it's gonna happen. But if we're in a specific neighborhood, I'd like to use that same technology to push out messaging uh, to potential communities or residents that could be impacted by any police action. So they have some type of heads up um, you know, knowing what's going on. One, because everybody's not on social media and everybody's not watching the news. But we do know that most folks are carrying cell phones. So that, again, that's a lesson learned. I mean, I definitely understand that. I'll, I'll just say from, you know, what we, I think what we saw around the country was that curfews were tough. You know, like they were not abided by in a large part. They amped up kind of aggressive response in some places, made it confusing about whether people wanted to stay. And for example, if somebody wanted to be present and protect a business um, that they particularly owned, uh, they became complicated areas. But um, I'm sure we'll continue to have this discussion. Um, my last question is, you know, we've discussed this before and, um, you know, appreciate uh, the fact that the department will make a statement uh, later when we go through the bill. But due to the dangerous and sometimes lethal nature of tear gas, rubber bullets, and pepper spray, um, and that the PPD's own directive says that there's no justification for the use of pepper spray against nonviolent protesters. Can you clarify again for the record what the department's current policy is with regard to use of force and spe specifically the use of pepper spray and tear gas on nonviolent protesters? Yeah, our directive is that those munitions that you mentioned shall not be used against those who are peacefully demonstrating or passively resisting. And passive resistance would be uh, someone who chooses not to follow an order, but they're not doing it, it's verbal, right? They're not physically confronting. They might be sitting there um, and saying, no, I won't leave. But there again, there's no violence used. So the, the directive is that uh, munitions shall not be used against those folks. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And I'll uh, wait for the next round. Thank you, Member Gim. Chair recognizes Member Brooks. Thank you so much, uh, Um My question, um, can you specifically talk about um, the current disciplinary actions uh, that have occurred? That have occurred um, as a result of the May and June incidents across the police force, um, and also within the city administration around uh, the actions on Fifty Second Street and Seventy Six. So. I can't go into specifics about disciplinary actions yet because a lot of uh, investigations are still ongoing. I know that there are approximately um, 50 
use of force investigations um, that are underway between the West Philly incidences and the incidences up on the freeway. Uh, those use of force investigations, which are also administrative investigations, can lead to further IA investigations if there are if, if it's been deemed that force was was out of compliance or uh, not in alignment with our policy or our procedures. Uh, there were seven that we know of separate direct complaints made against police that were made directly with IA. So there's a lot of ongoing investigations right now. Again, they're all fluid. We could get more. Uh, depending on if more people come forward, obviously um, there could be additional investigations as a result of the after action reviews as well. And, you know, there were two uh, highly publicized disciplinary actions uh, that we know of that that took place and we don't know if there'll be more. Thank you. I have one other question. I'm pivoting now to the budget. How does the PPD acquire munitions and who approves that spending and how much does the PPD spend per year on less lethal munitions? Okay, thank you. I'll, I'll turn your question over to uh, Deputy Commissioner Coulter. Yes, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Check the clock. It is still morning. Good morning, Councilwoman and panel. Um, with non lethal munitions um, in 2020, we spent about $3,500. In the last five years, we spent $65,000 in non-lethal. Most of that was a one-time purchase in 2017 because most of our non-lethal was expired. So it had to be replaced because they have expiration dates on it. So out of all our, our munitions in five years, we spent $65,000 on non-lethal. Um, the process for acquiring it is the commanding officer of the unit that needs it submits a memo through their chain of command. Um, if there's anything that is questionable or something that needs to be discussed, the executive team, our members will discuss it and then I'll make a determination regarding approval. So um, it goes through to the chain. Normally in these instances, it's the commanding officer of SWAT who is making the request because they house the inventory on the non-lethal and um, it goes through their bosses. They check to make sure that it's stuff that comports with our policy and our memos. Um, just to clear it up, I'm sure Deputy Commissioner Singleton can elaborate. Non-lethal munitions are used in a lot more instances other than um, the types of situations that we discussed here today. Some of them are used on barricades and different instances where they're a necessary part of SWAT operations. In addition, some of them are used in our training components to make sure people are prepared and um, have the ability to use them. So they're not all used in actual situations. Some of them are used in training scenarios. Thank you. You're welcome. Is that it, Member Brooks? That's my line of questioning, yes. Thank you so very much. Member Green, I believe you had some questions. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Commissioner Atlaw, uh, thank you for being here uh, for um, this hearing. I have a few questions I want to ask. Um, my first question deals with the impact of the pandemic. Um, from your perspective, what impact did the pandemic have on police operations um, that led to these two incidents? Uh, well, well, I would say again, you know, once the incidences occurred, we really had to say, all right, pandemic aside, we have to do what we would usually do uh, and then try to implement whatever safety guidelines we could considering the pandemic. Uh, with that said, um, the pandemic has really forced us to think how we respond to things differently from day one, whether it's responses to calls for service uh, or how we make arrests or how we you know, interact with large crowds of people. Early on, we didn't have a lot of PPE to allow us to get out and engage. So we had to be very careful about how we chose to engage, who we engaged uh, and when. And then also, again, we didn't, we weren't seeing the numbers of people on the streets um, that we had been seeing in previous times. So our, even though we know our shootings and homicides were up, our part one crimes and burglaries and other things had gone down. So our need to staff at higher levels for certain things 
it, again, it just really wasn't a requirement at the time because there weren't a lot of people on the street. Okay. And of course, I think that went to, you know, a, a lot of the insight or what they thought would happen with the upcoming uh, demonstrations. Also, you talk about uh, social media um, and um, PPD using um, social media intel in reference to um, just in general. What type of perspective did you gather um, from your surveillance of social media um, leading up to um, both 676 and 52nd Street? There wasn't a lot of anything. Um, you know, we knew that that day that or that Saturday we would be planning for a demonstration in response to the tragedy around Mr. Floyd. We knew it would be centralized downtown by City Hall, and that was it. There was no intelligence indicating uh, that there would be looting or rioting or any level of violence associated with that. And furthermore, there was nothing indicating um, even a peaceful demonstration or a planned demonstration in other parts of the city that we were aware of. So again, our efforts were focused downtown. Um, but when I say, um, you know, again, going back to lessons learned, um, my belief is that we could have had more officers or more resources available based on the numbers that we were expecting to show up, whether it was peaceful or not. Because again, we know that that initially that demonstration was peaceful. And then once it got dark and it disbanded, that's when everything happened. So um, again, there, there was hardly any intelligence, if any, at all as it related specifically to Philadelphia and what we could plan for in subsequent days. Uh, earlier in your testimony, you talked about use of force reports um, and you talked about those being completed. Can you give us some perspective on the oversight of making sure those use of force are re being done on a regular basis? Sure. So Directive 10.2 lays out very clearly what our use of force notification procedure is. It's pretty lengthy. Um, but our IA or our internal affairs unit uh, remains the unit responsible to ensure that our use of force reports are being completed as necessary and per the directive that I just mentioned. Um, the use of force in any situation, large or small, we know, has to be necessary, reasonable, and proportional. And these are the things that IA is, you know, are, are reviewing in these reports. Um, the, but we're not just looking at the officers, we're also looking at the actions of both supervisors and officers that use force. So again, the, the directive lays out very clear what the process is. Uh, one thing though, again, early on that I, I mentioned was lacking and was implemented uh, through executive order was again, requiring folks who use force or officers who use force to come up on the air and state that they used force. So I could go back and audit uh, those CAD audio tapes and make sure that, you know, there was a, in a, an accompanying use of force report um, so we can initiate an investigation. And I will say this, you know, in normal times, when you have one incident, it's far easier to say, okay, at the end of the shift, did everybody get their use of force report done so we can get these investigations initiated? These were ongoing incidences. So while we might look at it, you know, look at it as an incident on the 31st, an incident on the 1st, we were utilizing a lot of the same resources and it was pretty much go to work, do what you can, sleep, jot down what you remember, go home, eat, get up, do it all over again because it was continuous. So given that, um, you know, several days had elapsed, it was important to make sure that in the short term, uh, we implemented some mechanisms to ensure that when it was all said and done, we had a way to go back and audit um, what had occurred over the several days. Um, during both the situation at 676 and 52nd Street, uh, and I'll say more so at 676, um, various journalists were arrested. Um, and what is the process of interaction if I identify myself as a journalist? Um, how does that interaction occur? Um, because there seems to be some disconnect uh, in that area. Yeah, so the process, and this is what most journalists have done um, in, in recent past and even during these incidents as well. When they identify themselves as a journalist or a member of the media, um, we recognize them and we allow them to either, um, you know, if they want to leave, they leave. 
but we also make sure that there is a space for them where they can be safely. They're close enough to be able to report on whatever it is they need to report on, um, but they're out of the way of the police response and any ongoing activity or interaction between what's going on um, with demonstrators or whomever that group is and the police at that time. So if they identify themselves, they've been given that accommodation. Many reporters and journalists have been given that accommodation. Uh, we also know and we've experienced here in Philadelphia and in speaking with my colleagues in other cities throughout the country as recently as Saturday, we also know that there are members of the media, uh, whether it's main, mainstream media, bloggers or whomever, that intentionally do not identify themselves. They take part in the activity and they don't in, identify themselves as media until uh, police action is taken, whether they're either uh, being detained, uh, questioned, or even arrested. So what we're saying is we, we, we don't have the ability to discern. We need you to identify yourself early on so we can make the proper accommodations, but you can't have it both ways. You can't participate in what's been deemed illegal activity and then say, oh, wait, oh, wait, I'm media. Recognizing there's a lot of gray area there, we've been uh, in communication with some media outlets to uh, identify ways to enhance our training and ensure that uh, we come up with a strong policy around that. And then also maybe even co-teach in these trainings so we could also share uh, with their employees and their staff um, what we're looking at from, from our lens and our ability or our inability to discern uh, who's who uh, if they're not willing to identify themselves uh, in, a, in a very visible way. Coming out of both of these situations, uh, there's been, um, I've participated as well as other members of council have participated in various town hall meetings and other conversations. Um, more recently, one of the issues that has come up is a concern in reference to um, actions that may occur after the November 3rd election. Um, some issues that have been raised and some people are um, concerned about additional um, activity and unrest that may have occurred. Um, earlier you talked about lessons learned. Um, what are some of the things that uh, I can go back to some of those constituents in regard to their concerns regarding lessons learned and how the police department is preparing for potential unrest uh, so we don't repeat what happened um, with these two situations? Uh, yeah, so we're actually looking at pre, now, during the elections and post, as opposed to just what may happen after the fact. And what's important is, you know, we were working with, with the city and other stakeholders to ensure all lines of communication are open. Um, but what's most important for us, uh, the police department, is ensuring that we maintain open lines of communication. Intelligence is really, really, really key. Um, so that means not only ensuring that the DIVIC is pushing out any information that they have, but keeping in constant contact uh, with the FBI uh, or any other uh, bodies that are gathering security data so we can be well, you know, well versed in advance of what we may see. The problem with all of that right now is that it's clear as mud. There isn't any intelligence that's specific to Philadelphia on what could occur or what may occur. So we're all planning for a party that may or may not happen, right? It, it may be Y2K all over again. We don't know. But with that said, we have to be prepared. Being prepared, meaning that we have ample resources, deployment, uh, so we can deploy resources in the same way. So we've kind of learned using our blueprint um, from what happened May 31st and, and June 1st, when we deploy, we're not just deploying in one, in one part of the area or one part of the city, downtown, and protecting critical infrastructure there. When we deploy, we're making sure that we have a, enough bodies that's available downtown, that can uh, be available to rove, that can be available to answer calls for service, because those don't stop just because there's civil unrest. And then also those locations throughout the city that we saw that experienced disruption, looting, rioting, violent, uh, and other acts of violence as well. So making sure that we have enough bodies uh, to be available all throughout the city. We also have roving details um, around polling centers. We've asked for information uh, historically, which polling sites might have had the most activity or calls for police uh, in the past, so we're paying attention to that. We know by law we can only deal with so many feet of a polling place, uh, but we have security measures. We will be having some security measures in place 
so that we can respond quickly if need be. Um, the DA's office will have um, a task force available that can answer any legal questions if we have any as it relates to the election and you know in the cans and the shoulds and so on and so forth. We asked I personally asked the DA to allow his ADAs to be embedded with us uh, so they can be available with us. Same thing, I have a call uh, later on this week to get an update and briefing from the FBI and the U.S. Attorney. Uh, the U.S. Attorney will have AUSAs on ground as, as well. The FBI will have a command center here as well. So communication around intelligence is key. I will also tell you what's extremely important. I asked um, the DA's office for a list of applicable statutes. So we all know when we see something, what is it? What are we dealing with, right? So we talk about Fishtown and, and other areas or protecting of statues. You know, the law has to be very clear to all of us because again, it's assumed that everyone knows. And, and I will say the, the statutes around election law, they're not as clear as a lot of people would think. But we do know, unless the governor says, you, Danielle Outlaw, I want you to come here and protect uh, whatever this is, unless that happens, if I come and do that on my own, it's not, that's not legal. It has to be a request from the governor. So we now that we know it's not legal, what's the applicable statute? If we see this, how are we enforcing it? What, what laws do we use, right? So we're, we're putting together fact sheets, cheat sheets uh, for our rank and file so we can push that out of roll call training. So again, everybody's on the same page. Education and, and awareness is important. I think um, uh, communication strategy is also important. We're working with the city around that so we can also educate residents on what the law is. Um, because again, we find ourselves being asked after the fact, well, such and such did this to me, why didn't you do anything about it? And we have to be on the defense and explain why we did or did not do anything. Or if a misdemeanor occurred and it wasn't in our presence, what that private complaint process is later on down the road. So an education campaign campaign is also underway with that. Ensuring that we have proper deployment and resources available uh, is underway. And then again, working very closely with the DA's office and the US Attorney's office is important. I'll also put out there and be very clear that folks don't just put on social media, hey, we're gonna go do whatever it is a few weeks from now or two days from now. It's often a few minutes before. So the reason why we have to make sure that we have ample resources so we can at least respond in a timely manner is because we don't know what we don't know and we probably will not know until it's occurring or as it's occurring. So I wanna make that very clear. But again, there's a lot of things underway and I, you know, to my, um, Managing Director Alexander might want to step in to speak to what the what the city is doing because again we're only one portion. Of yeah, that. I, I just so. want. To, thank you, Commissioner. I wanted to add, Council Chair Member. recognizes Managing Director Tamar Alexander. Sorry, Mr. Chair. That's all right. Thank you, Council Member. I just wanted to add that, and uh, we are also coordinating and communicating with a host of uh, external partners, including the City Commissioners, who who are embedded on these conversations with us and police and other departments, uh, certainly around security issue, but also around issues of uh, election operations. Um, we do probably three calls or three meetings a week with those parties uh, talking through issues and trying to you know, solve issues and solve uh, problems that come up in real time. Uh, we've also benefited from through the work of both the police department and national organizations getting some training and intel on uh, just what other cities are seeing as it relates to election violence or election uh, unrest. Uh, we've we've had about two or three of those trainings that's been helpful and that's been um, sort of organized and managed through OEM and through the police department and other intelligence agencies to sort of give us and the city commissioners that insight and that look on that. But it's a lot of coordination going on certainly right now, like the commissioner said, and we'll continue post election on ensuring that uh, that we we are able to support citizens who are voting, you know, ability to vote safely, and we're able to support the uh, operations and the uh, results and the collections of all of our election uh, information and details. Um, thank you both um, for that information. That's good information for members of this committee, uh, which focuses on public safety, can bring back to our constituents. Um, I'll close um, with something more of a comment as opposed to a question. Um, both you, Mr. Alexander, as our 
the managing director and you, Commissioner Outlaw, have very challenging positions and roles, uh, also based on the fact that you are both African American. And myself, not only being a member of this body, but considering that I've also spent time um, in a law enforcement capacity as both an assistant district attorney as well as a assistant deputy public um, deputy attorney general in Delaware. I know the challenge of being an African American in those roles can be. Um, and so we give our police discretion to provide safety and also to act in ways um, to promote the public safety in our neighborhoods and communities. And as I was listening to, um, and I, I did not get his full title, I'll just say Officer Nash talk about, we did everything that was done in our power and we did the best we could do. My concern is that that was a couple of days after uh, the unrest occurred at 676 and 52nd Street. And we are in a digital age. And when you see the videos and the perspectives of people carrying bets, and I understand from a pure policy perspective, um, you can't just arrest someone just because they have an item in their hand. But when you, uh, officers are using their background and information as well as individuals as humans. And when you see the actions that we're taking and the language that was being used um, and the dynamic that was occurring at that point in that neighborhood in Fishtown, I, I and I would think many others believe if that same type of dynamic occurred in another community uh, with people of a different ethnic persuasion, there may have been a different perspective. And I think that is part of the challenge that we had regarding policing and communities of color because we give our officers discretion to act. There are times when someone may go through a stop sign and they don't get arrested and there's times that they do get arrested. And I and the issue that pains me is the fact of how at times we're doing all that we can do and take one perspective and how we use discretion and other times we do discretion to be much more aggressive in how we enforce the law. And I think that is the challenge and the perspective I got coming out of watching the images that occurred in Fishtown in response to the unrest as well as some of the other areas. So I know you're in a very challenging position and when you leave the roundhouse or when you leave um, municipal service building and you don't have on a, a uniform or a suit, you are an African American woman or a black man. And I know that and you're always living with the skin you are in. But at the same point is these challenges which cause and continue the, the inability for us to get some things done because people have the perspective based on their own eyes and background that the discretion is not being used the same way equally. Um, that, that's why on November 3rd, you know, we'll have a ballot question on a number of issues, one including a police advisory commission, which the chair of this committee has pushed because people don't believe that there's true oversight, even though both of you are doing what you can, but there's still that historical issues. So I just want to um, make that comment. I had some additional thoughts that I was going to say, um, but I'm going to leave it with that um, because I think this is part of the challenge we have at this day and at this time uh, in our city. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Member Green. One ethnic group with bats is a group of people going to a gang fight. Another group of ethnics with bats are coming from a softball game to celebrate. Uh, that's implicit bias. That's seen through different lenses, depending on what your experience are. So I, all I would say to that is that as we write the manual that was not in existence before the uprisings, we will have between these hearings and these legislations that will uh, be reviewed and God willing pass a ruling guide that we will know what the norms 
should be. And that's, that's a part of communicating. That's a part of trial and error. That's a part of lessons learned. Um, Ms. Williams, is there anyone there to question these witnesses? Council Member Thomas. Member Thomas. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, uh, Commissioner Outlaw, as well as uh, Energy Director Alexander. Good morning, colleagues. Just very quickly, a um, couple questions. Um, first and foremost, um, how many people, how many police uh, were deployed onto 52nd Street into 676? And do you have an estimate of like the cost of that over time? Good morning. Good morning, Council Member Thomas. Good morning. Um, I can give you a rough estimate of our numbers, but I think we'll probably have more precise numbers once all the investigations are concluded. Um, speaking to PPD solely, we know um, for 50, the 52nd and Market area, because it grew beyond just 52nd and Market, we had approximately 200 officers, PPD officers there. Um, and then for 676, there were a little over 100 PPD officers. Uh, as it relates to overtime, I'll go ahead and let Commissioner Coulter jump in on that one. Uh, good morning again, Council. Um, the only information I can give you, not specific to 52nd or 676, was the cost of those individual days of police overtime, because officers, as you know, were juggled from one location to the next and moved to various spots. But for the five days that the request was made from the 31st to the 5th, the police department spent a little over $7 million in overtime to police um, both the protests as well as the civil unrest in areas all over the city. It's not germane or specific to 676 or 52nd market. It was encompassing all police activities that was related to what started out as protests and then evolved in different areas as different things. Thank you, Commissioner. Just for clarity, you said seven million, right? Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, last question, and then I'll uh, I'll be done, Mr. Chair. Uh, what is the process um, for a, a request when you're utilizing uh, some of the, the the weapons that we've seen, such as tear gas, uh, rubber bullets? When 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 someone wants to use um, any of those type of, uh, I guess you could say, um, devices, uh, what documentation is required, and um, how does that reporting take place? And also, just for, for us and our general public, keeping in the same spirit that Councilmember Green talked about, um, how has this process changed since June so that we'll be more prepared if another incident might present itself? So uh, I, I want to say from aside from pepper spray and the electronic control weapons that's carried by all officers, uh, all of our less lethal munitions are only used by the SWAT unit. Um, and they have the training and uh, they're the ones that are responsible solely for deploying the tactics as it relates to those. Um, unless there are circum uh, incident circumstances, the incident commander has been responsible for authorizing the use of this equipment. But I will say I made very clear that during these times, if these munitions were to be used, specifically tear gas or any direct fired munitions, meaning these are munitions to um, mark an individual, for example, uh, that might be responsible for agitating larger crowds, but you, we use this um, to mark someone and then a group would then go in and extract that individual from, uh, from the crowd. I explicitly stated that authorization had to be uh, received from me, from the incident commander, and that was made very clear. Um, that hasn't changed since. Uh, we haven't used them since, um, but that was the protocol that was put in place. Again, OC or pepper spray or the other, uh, or an electronic control weapon like a taser all officers carries those and they are all guided under the, the policy as it relates to use of force and they have the individual discretion to utilize that um, if they feel the need to do so within policy. You asked about changes. Um, I think I kind of went through um, changes specifically. Was there something specific that you wanted to know, sir, around that? 
Commissioner, no, just changes that might have happened as it relates to the use of these type of weapons since June. Yeah, I mean, again, there was a moratorium that was placed um, to allow us to take a deeper dive and a look at our policy to see if there was something lacking. We did find that our SOPs, the SWAT SOPs, needed to better reflect the overall policy, but the policy is what the policy is um, as it relates to use of force in the, in the use of the munitions. But again, I think the one thing that would change, not since these incidences, but since my arrival here, uh, was me um, requiring uh, them to ask me, the incident commander, to ask me for, for authorization of use of those. Thank you, Commissioner Outlaw. I appreciate it. And I um, look forward to continuing to work with you um, as you've been somebody who's been very um, accessible to us um, as it relates to what we're trying to do to continue to improve uh, the way we service our city. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate you. And thank you to all my colleagues uh, for um, this important conversation. Thank you, Member Thomas. Ms. Williams, is there anyone left to question the Commissioner and Managing Director Alexander? Yes, Council Member Gim had additional questions. Just Member um, Gim. thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, just a few pieces of clarification, I think, um, because I think many of one, I, I want to say again, Commissioner Outlaw, um, I do appreciate your uh, collaboration and coming here today to discuss things um, to reflect and, you know, to I think we heard um, a significant amount of grace around recognizing where there were uh, clear problems and a desire to fix them. Um, one of the questions that I did continue to have uh, relates back to my earlier question about how we evaluate situations as they evolve um, and recognizing that there are blanket kinds of things like there's a curfew that exists, um, there's a location, you know, 676, um, where you, you know, you may have like some theory about like, is this, does, do you forfeit, you know, your First Amendment freedoms automatically by, you know, being in this space um, or or not, you know, and I think that that's one area. I think one of the things that, that I'm trying to understand is that as you have taken a look, and this is something that Council Member Green spoke to really powerfully, but as you've taken a look at past videos and other types of things, was it your feeling or are you able to say now that uh, 676 was a non-peaceful, was it a non-peaceful protest? Or uh, let me say that a little better. Was it, uh, was it a First Amendment demonstration or did do you still believe that it was not peaceful? So I, I can't go into specifics because again, the specifics about what happened uh, at that day is, are still under investigation. But I will say this, and I've said this publicly before, something happened. And so what these investigations are gonna glean for us are timeline. We're talking about whether or not police response was proportionate to what they were experiencing <laughs> at that time. We saw video of, uh, you know, a, a vandalized, police car, a state trooper car. Um, there are testimonies from officers saying that they were taking rocks and bottles of things. So something happened there. And again, the evidence left on the ground shows that. But again, the question and what the investigation will reveal is uh, at what time um, did our response uh, reply to what was being experienced, right? And, and therefore was it proportionate. So I can't say either way. And I know you're looking for a clear cut answer, but I don't think we're going to have one um, because at some point it might have been peaceful or passive resistant because we've seen some some instances where that was the case. But we also know that there are some other cases where it shifted and it transitioned from that. And the question that we all want answered is is when. Yeah, I mean would you know one of the issues and i think part of the reason why we're talking about tear gas and the rubber bullets issue that that were you know that is on the table right now is that in part it's pretty indiscriminate in terms of its deployment it's not a targeted uh type of uh you know um it's not a targeted type of uh 
device or practice. Um, and what we saw was that indeed there was, you know, shoot deployment of those devices towards individuals who are not on 676. They were up on top of the, you know, above the embankments, behind gates, clearly not participating. Um, I think we felt the same thing on 52nd Street where you heard that there were people who were pretty far removed from what they felt was like any kind of like activity that they were consciously engaged in or, you know, that they did not feel like they were in a situation that would have warranted it. And then yet still having, you know, large size canisters uh, deployed at them without warning. Um, you know, because of that, I think it's one of the reasons why we've been looking more closely at why we want to um, put a, you know, ask the police department to engage in a policy that makes a moratorium, you know, permanent, that it's not a First Amendment device, that there are other crowd control management techniques that have been highly effective and, and indeed have been used for more than two decades around this. So I don't know if you had any perspective or anything additional to add to that. No, I mean, and, and I, I want to be very clear in that, you know, our policy is what it is, and I expect the policy to be followed. The law allows for a totality of circumstances uh, to be considered, and the law also allows for officers to protect themselves and identify threats and to neutralize them in the safest way possible. And I think what we're talking about here when we're talking about crowd management is what's the best tactics for us to be able to identify a threat or potential threat and to target that threat as best possible without indiscriminately or unintended, uh, you know, having the unintended consequence of involving others or impacting others who might not be involved or a part of that threat. So again, that's what we're constantly thriving uh, to perfect. I don't think anyone has figured it out. I am grateful that the extent of injuries um, weren't beyond what they were um, from from everyone. And again, I, I, I'm glad we have the ability to speak from a space where, you know, and, and I'm not saying this to be facetious, but I'm glad we can say no one died here because in other cities, they, ex they experienced casualties mm -hmm. and not necessarily as a result of police action, um, but by actions of those involved in these crowds. <laughs> <clears throat> so we do know that the, the, the threats do exist. Mm -hmm. If we are not present, it could have been worse than what it was. But we have to make sure that we work on our responses uh, moving forward to ensure that, again, we don't have the unintended consequences that we're talking about today. And, you know, the only thing that I would add, and again, I want to thank uh, my council colleagues for having, um, you know, just invested a lot in this process and also to you, Commissioner Outlaw, as well, but um, you know, last night uh, the Police Advisory Commission uh, released some of its findings around the Plainview project and report. And um, <clears throat> you know, this was we are now what 13 months since the release of the Plainview project, which exposed a lot of you know some you know uh, social media postings uh, that that that, you know, uh, I would say had had a lot of relevance still today. Um, a number of the comments, I think, as was highlighted by the investigator at the time, talked about police resentment and anger, not everybody, but certainly the ones who were exposed uh, in the in the Plainview project report um, about protest and protesters in general. And, you know, I think, again, it underscores the need to um, as much as rigorous as we are with, you know, what are the laws and everything, but to, you know, really train people around First Amendment rights, what they look like, what they are, you know, um, and then when they when they don't exist, um, you know, because one, I, I know this has been alluded to before, but I, I did ask um, whether if the kinds of vigilante groups that we saw um, feeling empowered down in South Philly or Fishtown or other places, if they were surrounding a polling place with the same kind of language and verbiage and same type of thing, would, you know, w could we actually see that as being different? You know, and it is, 
it is something that we are going to be confronting potentially within the next couple of weeks, especially as people have demanded to become poll watchers illegally, you know, that they think that they can walk into places um, and and confront individuals. Um, so, you know, it's another reminder of how important this is. Thank you. Um, my last question is for uh, uh, for our managing director, Tumar Alexander. Um, you know, just for clarity, I wanted to ask, who um, I want to ask a little bit more about the Unified Command Group. Uh, this is a group that kind of pulled together um, uh, during the during May and June. I, I'm I wanted to ask if you could share a little bit about the background of the Unified Command Group. How does it make decisions, and does it still exist right now around it, or does it only exist in emergency situations? Yeah, thank you, Councilwoman. Um, certainly the Unified Command Group, we've utilized that structure as it relates to emergency incidents and our responses to emergency incidents. So it wasn't only utilized in the George Floyd situation, we've also utilized, you know, I talked a little bit uh, with Council Member Green about our work with the city commissioner. So we have a, you know, UCG or Unified Command Group stood up for election operations. Uh, we have a Unified Command Group also stood up for COVID and that's probably been our longest running and ongoing unified unified command group. So, uh, you know, the membership or the makeup of, of that particular group were varied by types of emergencies. Uh, the formation of a UCG is consistent, you know, it's just the core principles of National Incident Command System. Um, and, you know, that's principles published by both the U.S. Department of Homeland Security and FEMA just on how cities, counties, states, and others sort of respond to emergencies. The intent is while we're in an emergency situation, the ability for uh, departments, eight departments and agencies to be able to talk with each other in real time, being able to solve issues in real time, being able to address problems, whether that's resource problems, whether that's coordination problems uh, in real time. Uh, so certainly that structure has helped us uh, respond to different emergencies. Um, and then just like I said, again, that the makeup of that group uh, will vary by sort of situation. Um, to, in particular, you know, one, one of the probably um, managing director's office, Office of Emergency Management are on most of them uh, or, you know, on most of them, they're organized and sort of staffed by Office of Emergency Management in terms of helping us send out meeting invites, structuring, uh, certainly working with the managing director and the managing director's office will put together agendas for various UCG calls. So that, you know, that that particular makeup uh, will vary by sort of by incident. Okay, thank you very much. Um, you know, those that concludes all my questions. The, the only last thing that I just wanted to say again to Commissioner Outlaw and to the administration, again, thank you for coming about this. Um, we are going to create you know, new policies. There are going to be after action reports. There will be the conclusion of investigations. But at the end of the day, I don't honestly believe that things can change unless people can hear uh, a little bit about what uh, Council Member Green talked about the stark difference in treatment. And it's why we started with the 30 uh, plus members of our communities um, to be able to ask people to, to be seen and heard. And it's the resident on 51st Street who asked, why can't you see me and say hello and acknowledge that I'm here, you know, I'm part of this community in the city. And um, I think it's the thing that people can't quite see yet. So as much as we'll do on policy, the only thing that will really change things is a seismic change in the public understanding and in our willpower. And I just want to thank both of you for being engaged in that process. Thank, thank you, Council you. Chairman. Thank you, Member Jim. Ms. Williams, is there anyone who wishes to question this panel? There are no additional questions. Um, Council Member Johnson wanted to note that he was present for the record. Thank you, Member Johnson. We um, can move on to panel two. Um, Councilman, if you're ready. Yeah, we're ready. Okay. Um, I will call up panel number two. Uh, thank you to panel number one. Panel number two is Linda Garcia, City Controller Rebecca Reinhart, and Nicole Phillips. Welcome. Uh, it's still morning, so good morning. Good morning. Thank you for your patience. Um, and please 
State your name for the record and begin your testimony. Do you want um, me to start or? You're the highest ranking. <laughs> Okay, well, thank you. Thank you for having me here this morning. Uh, good morning, Councilman Jones, Chairman, uh, uh, Councilman Johnson, and the members of the Committee on Public Safety. Uh, I'm Rebecca Reinhardt, Philadelphia City Controller. I do want to take a brief moment to recognize Councilmember Gim for sponsoring this bill, uh, and also Councilmembers Jones, Gautier, uh, Brooks, Green, Thomas, Gilmore Richardson, and Parker for signing on to this resolution. and and allowing us to have this much needed conversation about the city's response to the protests in May and June and about recommendations for improving police relations with the public. So thank you. Thank you. After, after George Floyd's murder by police in Minneapolis in late May, people across the country took to the streets to decry the violence, lift up the Black Lives Matter movement and demand change and end to systemic racism and oppression. Most of the protests were peaceful expressions of righteous anger and frustration, although some <clears throat> capitalized on the moment leading to looting and vigilantism. More than anything, the weeks of unrest raised questions about the city's preparedness and response to the protests and unrest. As city controller, my office is tasked with ensuring that taxpayer money is used in the most efficient and effective way for the benefit of all Philadelphians. As such, I announced on June 4th that my office would undertake an independent review of the city of Philadelphia's operational and resource deployment and tactics during this time. This independent review is being conducted by Ballard Spar and At Risk International. These firms were selected for their complementary experience in investigations and emergency management operations and resource deployment. Ballard and At-Risk have been conducting interviews with city employees and witnesses, reviewing policies, procedures, media recordings, news reports, communications, and evaluating best practices from across the country. Their work will also reflect feedback from community leaders and members, business owners, and activists through our Community Advisory and Accountability Council. I can't discuss particular details of this ongoing investigation right now. I can tell you that we intend to release the results publicly before the end of the year. It is my goal that through this review, we as a city can learn from these events. And in a time when city resources are stretched thin, we must ensure that the dollars are being used in the best use of every taxpayer and every resident every day, and especially in crisis situations. We need to know what went right and what went wrong so that we can do better in the future. It is my hope that this independent review will serve as a guide for city actions going forward. Thank you, and I'm happy to take any questions at this time. Thank you so much. If it's the pleasure of the committee, I'd like to allow this panel to testify, and then we'll begin questions. Seeing no objection, Thank you. State your name for the record and begin your testimony. Linda. Thank you. Uh, good morning. Thank you, Chairman Jones, Vice Chair Johnson, uh, Councilperson Gim, and the members of the committee. I am Linda Garcia. I serve as the Policing Program Director at the Leadership Conference on Civil and Human Rights, the nation's oldest and largest civil rights coalition that played a key role in planning the original March on Washington in 1963. Thank you for this opportunity to provide this testimony today. And I'd like to commend the city and Commissioner Outlaw for taking the first steps towards meaningful policing reform. The police responses to the protests in the wake of George Floyd's murder this past summer raised serious concerns about law enforcement's willingness to fulfill its obligation to respect the constitutional rights of all people. In some cities, police departments were able to maintain mostly orderly demonstrations that allowed protesters to safely exercise their First Amendment rights. In hundreds of others, including Philadelphia, officials employed militarized responses that were disproportionate to the threat posed by protesters, intimidated and attacked people, and endangered entire communities. I do acknowledge that sometimes these protests were also volatile. 
Such responses, however, only inflame tensions between communities and police, as they represent the very police violence that people are demonstrating against. While jurisdictions that the Leadership Conference works with vary by size and region, the challenge of police violence and the distrust it fosters are similar. But we're encouraged by the collective desire of state, local, and law enforcement leaders to take on the task of working with communities to develop policies and approaches that better address public safety. Such policies must also provide the framework for protecting and supporting communities' right to peacefully assemble, exercise a free speech, and petition their government to redress grievances. Among the best practices, I, three recommendations I'd like to share with the committee today. First, department leadership should engage in cooperative and strategic advanced planning for protests and engage community leaders during this process. Uh, taking a no surprises approach with group leaders can minimize distrust and build cooperative relationships. I want to know that it should have been anticipated given uh, that the protests were going to happen given what was happening across the nation. The protesters tactics may have changed, but in part this is because police brutality has not. Second, military grade equipment designed for combat zones does not belong in the hands of law domestic law enforcement agencies and should not be deployed in response to protest. Experience has shown that militarized police uh, responses escalate tensions, fuel anger, and exacerbate distrust of police. Which leads us to the fact that officers should use force only when necessarily necessary and should be required to use de-escalation tactics, policies that the police department does have in place. However, you must take a, 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 a care not to use in one community differently than in another. And Nothing here is more critical than setting a culture of anti-racism and heeding the calls of communities. Even the best policies on paper mean nothing without the accountability measures necessary to ensure that officers are not violating them. As the saying goes, culture eats policy for lunch. I would also like to underscore what Councilperson Green addressed in the use of discretion. And this is historically why black communities and other communities of colors have uh, led to the uh, it has led to the hyper policing and criminalization of those very communities. This was what people are protesting against and the protest cannot be viewed as isolated incidents without acknowledging the systemic racism that people are crying out against. By implementing policies to ensure that all people's constitutional rights are respected, we can begin to create a new era of public safety that respects the dignity and humanity of all people. Thank you. Always, always got to check the mute button. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, Samantha, who's next? Is there Nicole Phillips? Ms. Phillips. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Chairperson Jones, Vice Chairperson Johnson, and members of the P Public Safety Committee. I am Nicole Phillips from Montgomery McCracken, Walker and Rhodes. With me on the line today is Tammy Felix from CNA. To to excuse me, together we are leading the independent after action review of the city and police department's response to the protests and demonstrations that occurred in the city following the killing of George Floyd. We're here today to update the committee on who we are and the scope of our review. We thank council member Helen Gim for inviting us to speak to you today. Montgomery McCracken is a full service law firm based here in Center City. I'm a partner in the White Collar and Government Investigations Group, in which we have extensive experience in conducting internal investigations for corporate entities, as well as municipalities and government agencies. Our partner in this review is CNA, a nonprofit research and analysis firm based in Arlington, Virginia, with a strong history of de delivering objective reviews of real world incidents to local jurisdictions and federal agencies. The team has led and supported after action reviews of the planning and response to special events that have drawn mass protests and demonstrations across the nation. CNA is currently conducting similar after action reviews in Richmond, Virginia, Antioch, California, and North Charleston, South Carolina. 
The CNA team is comprised of research analysts and subject matter experts in the fields of law enforcement and emergency preparedness and response. The timeline of our review spans from around May 30th to June 15th. Through data collection and analysis and interviews with those involved, including law enforcement and members of the community, the review is taking a critical look at the city and police department's policies, procedures, and practices to identify whether it was compliant with current policies and whether its policies align with national standards and best practices. The police department and city leadership have been cooperative with, cooperative with our request. We are continuing to analyze data and conduct interviews of law enforcement and city leadership. In order to ensure that the report that we produce is comprehensive and thorough, we must hear from the community, those involved in the protests, residents of affected neighborhoods, impacted businesses and community organizations. We have been able to conduct those interviews and viewed the uh, public hearings by city council uh, two weeks ago. And we appreciate that opportunity to hear from members of the community in that way. But we are continuing to reach out to community members individually so that we can hear in more depth about their experiences. We appreciate being able to hear from the community via uh, those public hearings as well. We expect that the report produced at the end of the review will provide recommendations that the Philadelphia Police Department is encouraged to implement to further improve public safety, transparency, and restore the trust of the community. While today we're not in a position to discuss the substance of our research and findings at this time, we will be prepared to do so when we produce a report, which we do anticipate being around the end of the year as well. This at this time concludes my testimony and Tammy Felix is on the line with me and we are happy to respond to questions at this time. Thank you, council person, excuse me, chairperson. Thank you, appreciate your uh, testimony. Uh, is this the entire panel, Ms. Williams? Yes, it is. Are there any members that wish to ask questions? Council member Gim had a question. Member Jim? Yes, thank you very much, uh, Council Chairman. And um, I want to thank uh, the members, uh, the panelists today um, for taking time to share some of the work. Um, many of you have been doing this for a very long time. And so your insights as they develop um, will be very important. Um, a couple of very quick questions for uh, Ms. Phillips. What is the timeline for the completion of your report? Yes, uh, Councilwoman Gim, uh, around the end of the year as well, um, we are in the midst of writing and researching now. So we are preparing to produce the report. And will you, I know that you covered a lot of different areas, standard operating procedures, best practices, policies, et cetera. Um, but I think one of the things that we heard both from two weeks ago and, and from today is that we can have all of those things in place, but they still don't get followed. In what way are you incorporating culture and practice um, into, into your report and investigations? Yes, so those are certainly things that we are reviewing. Our intention and our expectation is that our report will not be something that is just a document, but that it will be a living guide for going forward. We appreciate hearing from uh, Police Commissioner Outlaw today and all of the efforts that have already been made by uh, the department under her leadership. Um, and we hope that this document and these recommendations will be able to be used by uh, Commissioner Outlaw and other city leaders as a guide to continue forward in the implementation of those new practices and creation of culture, restoration of public trust, et cetera, that this document will assist in that process going forward. And were you able, do you plan to take a look at the Plainview project findings that they were, I don't, I don't know, I'm, I apologize, I wasn't sure if your team was on the call last night with the Police Advisory Commission. Um, have you been reviewing those at all or do you see any role for the Plainview project reporting? So you, yes, so we were not on the call last night, but I am well aware of uh, the PAC's report. Um, and that they have recently re produced. And certainly that is something that we will review. And for any relevant information, we will definitely incorporate that into our work. 
Absolutely. Thank you so much. Um, my other question is for uh, Ms. Garcia. And again, thank you so much for Leadership Conference on Civil and Human Rights for all the work that you've been doing nationally. Um, certainly right now, I know you're deeply engaged in the protection of voting rights all across the country. So, you know, it's been a great partnership and really appreciate your being so supportive um, over a number of, of months as we try to figure out this process. I mean, I think, you know, you spoke to it very clearly, culture eats practice policy for lunch and um, we heard it. Uh, we have been here before, you know, uh, last night the Police Advisory Commission relayed out uh, their findings after more than 300 social media postings by police officers that talked about violence directed towards protesters, women, uh, Islamophobia, LGBTQ communities um, were certainly the targets. Um, members of our own body, uh -huh, committee chairman, you know, of of city council was was one of the people who are targeted. And so, you know, you you also have seen this before. You've been in the Obama administration. You've looked at consent decrees with police departments around this. I mean, what have you seen as being more effective um, in, ter in terms of improving culture, especially when you know that policies exist but may not be followed, where there's a lack of trust uh, and confidence in, in the police. Um, what do you have some, some other thoughts or some additional thoughts or developments around there? Sure, thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, the saying goes, culture eats policy for lunch. And this is um, policy is black and white on paper. Um, and without meaningful enforcement and ensuring that officers and, and departmentally that this is followed, um, it means nothing because we see very good policies in a lot of police departments across the nation, but you still see these problems arise. Um, so they must be accompanied by the accountability measures, right? And, and this can, I'll run through a few of them, but this means thorough chain of command reviews, random audits, and this can be of police reports, body-worn cameras, um, just any law enforcement activities that officers engage in. This is data analyses to identify potential patterns of misconduct, or even more systemically, how law enforcement activities are playing out, right? And if they're playing out where they are having a disparate impact in certain communities, you know, specifically communities of color and low income communities. Uh, robust investigations of external complaints, um, mechanisms for making internal complaints by police officers safe and so that they are not worried about retaliation. And then very importantly, community oversight, because that is such an important piece to have that transparency and the say of community in how police operate um, and how policing is happening in their communities is critical, right? And, and so I, I just want to finish this off by saying, uh, it has to prioritize uh, any police department, the policies, the city really has to prioritize the community well being, fairness, and, and anti racism, right? As you addressed with the social media posts, there just has to be a zero tolerance for that because no police officer that believes that can go and serve those communities. Lastly, um, there should be the investments in communities um, and thinking, rethinking the role of police. Perhaps sometimes it hasn't worked because police are not the focus best equipped to address every public health issue or social ill that um, arises. Yeah. Um, you yeah. know, Remember again, yes. if I could, I, I want to, I'm, I'm, I'm very pleased with this hearing thus far as chair, and I'm, I'm supposed to take a neutral, almost orchestra conductor policy, but I, I would, I would be remiss if I didn't say um, that uh, as we look to the passage of the Citizens Police Advisory Committee, that would be a hollow structure if we don't establish what they're talking about. Norms, policies, procedures, laws, trainings, all of those things go into a measure, uh, a, a, a baseline that we can then say, was this action correct 
or not. And so all of this is a continuum of what good policing should be. And so I'm thankful for all of the lenses that we've seen from thus far. And what is amazing to me is that no one testified thus far, and maybe I should knock on wood somewhere, in a defensive mechanism, in a CYA, cover my anatomy. People were open, forthright, about where they stood and why, and what to look at. And when you can do that in communications, you can come to understanding. So I just, I felt compelled to interject that and take the prerogative of the chair and say that. Please continue. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. And, you know, I think one of the things you highlight is that this is a dynamic process. This isn't a series of like hearings that exist and then after action reports that exist and, you know, uh, actions by police officers that, you know, occur and then they're all isolated from one another. We are in an active process of transformation. And I want to thank um, our committee chairman for leading the charge on the oversight um, on the Oversight Commission, uh, it has a lot of engagement by our communities, which I think, again, is the key to change and transformation. Um, I think that, uh, Ms. Garcia, you know, it is helpful to hear you say a lot of these, you know, make sure that these things are clearly in place. I think, you know, one of the areas that is certainly going to be a question is whether we do have a process for internal complaints to be raised without fear of retaliation. I don't know that that, um, and I would be interested to hear if that exists in any police department uh, right now, but certainly um, it feels like that's been a difficult area, uh, certainly for uh, really, you know, co highly conscious officers here in Philadelphia, um, along with other people who are interested in making change. Um, similar to what my committee chairman asked, you know, I'm, you, there are a number of after action investigations that are occurring. There'll be at least three different reports that will be issued. We didn't get a chance to hear from our police advisory commission, but they're also engaged in an after action review. What are you looking for in some of the after action reports um, and how should they be utilized in order for them to actually make a difference? Or, you know, you heard also the timeline, right? Like we're not gonna see this until likely the end of the year. Um, and part of this process is to build out a recognition that, you know, there are things that we can, must do. There are things that we can talk about, even if it's a little bit early um, that we need to do. But I'm interested in hearing from you. What are you looking for in the after action investigations and how might they be better used to make change? Sure, so a couple points on that. I think with every after action process that is happening, I cannot overstate, um, the importance of having community right there at the table, mm -hmm. right? And being an equal power broker in this because none of the recommendations that come out of it are going to be meaningful if they don't, uh, if they are not developed hand in hand, the solutions are not developed hand in hand with the communities um, that are mostly affected by policing. Secondly, um, you know, I was at the Department of Justice where we did, I did, uh, conducted pattern and practice investigations and uh, enforced consent decrees. And systemic reform does not happen overnight. Um, and I can tell you that Philadelphia is taking the first step on what is going to be a long uh, a long process, right? And there has to be the commitment and long-term investment um, to making sure that this happens. Um, and so, you know, I think, it is good to take on all these processes. I do want to note that um, I know Philadelphia, the police department and the city there has uh, signed the mayor's pledge, uh, the Obama Foundation's mayor's pledge, which we have partnered with Cities United um, to uh, help with and provide technical assistance through that process. And I think many of the changes that Commissioner Outlaw um, detailed are um, recommendations that we make. Um, but again, take the recommendations, work with the community and uh, invest, right? And I think there has to be an openness right now. I do hear it and I think it is encouraging an openness, not being defensive to talking about rethinking, redefining policing, rethinking public safety um, and, and thinking more broadly beyond just the policing systems into the systems that can actually help communities thrive.
Thank you so much. It feels like we take a lot of first steps, though. but thank you so much, Ms. Garcia, for all your help and assistance. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Member Gim. Ms. Williams, who's next? Councilwoman Gautier. Member Gautier. Uh, good morning. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, my question is also for Ms. Garcia. Um, I, you talked in your in your testimony about you know some of the um, military style tactics that were used and how that furthered the distrust between police and community. And I think this is such an important point um, for everything that we're, um, for many of the things that we're experiencing right now as a city. Um, for example, um, we're seeing record shootings and homicides. And I don't believe that we're going to be able to solve that problem if community members don't trust the police um, and, and feel like the police are a body that is um, against them, right? And so I think this will impact us um, even beyond the protests. Um, it is important for us to figure out. And I hear everything that you're saying about accountability and transparency um, and having community involvement in um, how policing happens. Um, but I'm wondering, what can we do you know, even before we get to those points and to those policies, what can we do to encourage healing? Um, you know, what we're, what we've experienced as a city has been very traumatic. Um, not only, you know, did we have trauma on May 31st and on June 1st, but this is um, trauma that goes back for decades and decades and decades, right? To things like a move, which also happened in West Philadelphia. And so I think, you know, before people can even be open to the policies and talk of what will change um, down the line, um, we have to also embark on a process of healing. What does that look like? Um, and has any locality um, that you know of been successful at um, going about a process of healing after some um, after these traumatic events? Thank you for that. Um, you, I couldn't agree with you more um, that there is a trauma that is experienced, not only with these events, but it is historic right? Um, studies have shown that even negative police interactions create trauma, um, long-term trauma, right? Um, students will, their GPAs will drop. Um, folks have uh, medical issues associated with it. And this is community large. Um, so there is no question that that exists when something like this happens. Um, in terms of, I mean, the first step, everyone, all the elected officials, police officials have to really reckon with this. They have to acknowledge the historical and systemic um, origins of policing. If we look back, I mean, policing stems from the early slave patrols, right? Police were the ones that were enforcing the black codes and Jim Crow laws. And what we are seeing now is just part and parcel, right, of that historical um, reality. Um, so it is going to be a restorative process. There has to be reconciliation and acknowledgement of those um, realities. I can say that the uh, Metropolitan Police Department here in D.C. has programs where police officers are actually um, uh, educated about this and, um, you know, uh, putting community members and police officers to actually have these conversations and acknowledge it, these realities are a first step. It is not going to be the answer um, in and of itself, but it is necessarily. And I do want to acknowledge one last thing that um, uh, as, as Councilperson again acknowledged, uh, there, it seems like you're taking a lot of first steps. This is exhausting for community members, right? This is exhausting to go through these processes, go through assessments and feel like nothing is ever changed. Right. Um, and uh, to that, I can only say that that is why um, it's critical that it is these changes are at this point community led, community involved. The solutions are developed hand in hand with communities. Thank you so much. I just want to say that 
you know, in my opinion, it doesn't matter. We can develop as many policies as we want. Um, if we do not go through a process, um, um, and, and this is a part of that process, but if we don't have a more exhaustive process of listening and healing, um, I don't think any of it will matter. And, and if I may, if I may acknowledge that, you know, I think it's very important to have um, services in place for folks that are victims of police brutality and even those um, that have been affected by the protest and in the happenings because to relive the traumas also when you, we ask folks to come to these hearings and share those stories, it is reliving um, police violence um, and that has to be acknowledged and, and folks need to be taken care of. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Who is next, Ms. Williams? Uh, we don't have any other questions in the chat and I think it's okay to move on to the first panel of witnesses for bill number 200538. So I look forward to the findings. I think they will um, serve as a ruling guide for how community policing should evolve. And so I'm thankful for your testimony and your work. Um, and with that, um, would you please, so there are no other for resolution number 2003 uh, nine, Seven, correct? Correct. So we can move on to bill number 200538. Correct. Um, can, you the first please read panel the title? can you please read again the title of the sure. bill? Sure. Bill number 200538, an ordinance amending Title 10 of the Philadelphia Code to create a new chapter, 102500 entitled Less Lethal Devices to regulate the use of less lethal devices in specific situations, all under certain terms and conditions. Member Gibb, do you have opening remarks? Yes, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Chairman. I'm gonna be very brief because I know we have a hard stop in 45 minutes and we wanna make sure that we are able to bring this uh, forth. So uh, today we're going to be hearing testimony on a bill sponsored by all members of the Public Safety Committee, as well as Council Member Catherine Gilmore Richardson that would require the Philadelphia Police Department to authorize a policy that bans the use of less lethal munitions in First Amendment situations. This bill is supported by the administration, which has submitted written testimony to the fact. But I do want to just to take a moment to clear up some misconceptions about this bill. This bill does not unilaterally remove less lethal devices such as tear gas, rubber bullets, pepper spray, or the like from the police department's arsenal. It clearly states that they must not be used against any individual engaged in First Amendment activities. I've seen a number of misleading quotes that somehow denying the police department the use of these dangerous, less lethal weapons will force them to somehow escal escalate and then suddenly start using lethal weapons. This concept is not only ludicrous, it is an insult to professionals within the police department, including the civil affairs unit and others who understand and utilize effectively crowd control management and de-escalation tactics. I personally have been in plenty of demonstrations over two decades of organizing that did not result in the kind of violence and chaos that we witnessed in May and June of 2020. The bill calls upon the PPD to set aside its weaponry when people march in protest. It's recognizing that tear gas, rubber bullets and the like are not just about being less lethal. They, have, they are uh, not studied. Um, I think that they have uh, there are lots of concerns about the dangerous impact that they have had, including death on, on some individuals. Um, they can cause lifelong health complications. They've clearly been deeply traumatic for many of the people who experience them, as we heard two weeks ago. Um, they have also not been deployed in this manner uh, in our city in decades, and we have weathered all manner of protest over the last 20 years. It will, however, as we heard earlier, challenge the police department and our city leadership to engage in rigorous exercise over what constitutes First Amendment activity and the level of discretion that goes into who um, is 
deemed worthy of such. Um, you know, before I was a council member, I was an organizer and the response to Springs Black Lives Matter protest in many ways undid years of collaboration and trust between our activist communities um, and our institutions. This bill is a first step, uh, yet another one of many first steps in reaffirming that public protest is not at odds with public safety and responses to public protest should not compromise public safety, plain and simple. Thank you very much. Thank you, Member Gam. Ms. Williams, can you please bring forth the first panel to testify on this bill? <coughs> Rachel Lopez, Shakira King, and Dr. Joseph Waduku. Are you there? Yes. Okay, can you um, state your name for the record and please begin your testimony and good morning, it's still morning. Good morning, um, it's actually afternoon, I'm in the UK right now, so uh, okay. joining you guys from across the okay. pond. Um, my name is Rachel Lopez, I'm an associate professor of law at Drexel's Klein School of Law and an expert in international human rights law. I also direct the Andy and Gwen Stern Community Lawyering Clinic, which provides free legal services to Drexel's neighbors in West Philadelphia. Along with the ACLU, I re represent a group of residents and protesters who were attacked by police in their homes um, and on their streets on May 31st and June 1st. At the end of the month, we will be filing a complaint with the United Nations urging them to investigate the human rights violations that my clients suffered at the hands of police. My client's stories speak to uh, both the ruthlessness of police on those days, as well as the direct need for this bill in particular. The police who were meant to protect and serve them brutalize them. As you have heard in testimony and seen in video footage on 676, 670, Highway 676, police corralled protesters from both sides of the highway, essentially forcing them to scale a steep hill instead of using safer means of escape. At the same time, officers repeatedly pelted those individuals with rubber bullets and tear gas, causing a stampede. St stampede. Some protesters tried to climb the high walls on the side of the highway, but were essentially trapped. My clients described being unable to breathe, feeling like they would die on that hill and seeing blood and hearing screams everywhere. At 52nd Street in West Philadelphia, the PP PPD indiscriminately and without warning deployed tear gas, pepper spray and rubber bullets on protesters and residents alike, including children and el elderly. One senior was hit twice by rubber bullets, first on his hand and then on his legs. His hand swelled to about twice his size and his legs was so swollen that he could not walk. Another elderly woman who was visiting her niece in the neighborhood was shot in the head by a rubber bullet. According to numerous eyewitnesses, including some of my clients, which we will detail in our submission to the United Nations, the police appeared to be targeting those that were well marked as medics and providing medical assistance to those residents that were injured by police, as well as reporters who were documenting that violence. Our clients also witnessed police repeatedly fire canisters of tear gas onto residential streets, people's porches, and sometimes through the open windows of houses. One mother barricaded herself and her uh, three-year-old and six-year-old son into a bathroom to escape the no noxious fumes that were spreading through their house. The police quite literally gassed them in their homes all during a pandemic. These acts put Philadelphians at grave risk of serious injury and possibly death, violating their human rights. Tear gas, pepper spray, and rubber, rubber bullets are classified as less lethal weapons. But as the name suggests, that does not mean that they cannot kill. According to the CDC, tear gas exposure can result in death either from respiratory failure or from severe chemical burns to the throat and lungs. If a tear gas canister hits someone directly, it can cause serious wounds, a concussion, and possibly lethal head in injuries. Also, as um, Councilwoman Gim mentioned, because of the nature of tear gas, it often has indiscriminate effects, meaning it can easily travel through the air uh, when the wind direction chains and hit bystanders um, and others that are nearby and cause stampedes. 
Tear gas is so dangerous that it's considered a chemical weapon under international human rights law and banned in wartime. In addition, according to UN, UN guidance, rubber bullets should never be shot at the torso or head for risk of skull fracture, brain injury, or damage to the eyes and, uh, and vital organs. Um, and this is particularly true for individuals like the ones I described above who are elderly and um, particularly susceptible to injury as a result of the use of these less lethal, lethal weapons. And the PPD policies um, as written are woefully inadequate to address these abuses. So as Commissioner Outlaw specified, there is a directive that's on point. It's called Police Directive 10.2. And this specifies, as, specifies that pepper, pepper spray should not be employed in situations where people are peacefully protesting. However, this does not include a similar prohibition for tear gas or rubber bullets. And that's why I'm here today urging you to support a ban on less lethal munitions against protesters and others exercising their First Amendment rights. Thank you for the opportunity to share my client's stories and for your consideration of the bill. Thank you so much for your testimony, Ann. Um, it is always difficult to hear um, when people go through traumatic events like that. Um, I'm going to ask the committee to hold their questions until after the entire panel uh, speaks because we are running on a hard stop at 1230. Who's next? Shakira King. Good so, morning. So in Philadelphia, I can say good morning. Yes, I am in Philadelphia. Good morning to everyone um, and thank you again. Chairperson and um, Councilman, Councilperson Gim for inviting me again to tell my story. Um, I have one brief comment to begin. I cannot believe that uh, our <laughs> police commissioner does not seem to understand or have a full understanding of First Amendment rights when Philadelphia is, quote unquote, the founding of our nation. Mm -hmm. And First Amendment rights were literally written here. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm just going to leave that at that. My name is Shakira King, and I am here to testify in support of the bill banning tear gas and other harmful weapons when interrupting First Amendment activity. I've lived in West Philadelphia my entire life. I've always been um, involved with a number of local organizations here in the city of Philadelphia and have been directly impacted by police violence by the hands of the Philadelphia Police Department, one which resulted in the loss of a beloved family member. I remember the day of May 29th clearly. It was a Sunday afternoon, and the night before, the city had been in a disarray. Many of my friends were in the thick of it the day before, so I spent the night on the phone ensuring that a number of my friends were safe. I woke up from my nap to hear helicopters and um, my neighborhood citizens app telling me that there was a cop car on fire at 52nd and Market. From the video provided by the bystanders who were out there, nothing was, nobody had particularly set the fire. Folks were standing in front of the Rainbow Clothing Store just watching the car sit there. I decided I would get up and go to 52nd and Walnut, which was not far from my house. When I got there, Two of my friends had told me that a police officer had just assaulted a young man so badly that his face was bleeding and that his friends had to take him home. I asked if there was a particular reason this young man had been assaulted and they told me no. They just started beating him and stopped when his friends rushed to uh, retrieve him. We decided to stand in front of Hakeem's bookstore, the oldest black bookstore owned in the city of Philadelphia. Once we got there, there was just a bunch of young people standing around. No one was hurt. Um, no one was in immediate danger. In immediate danger. Some young folks began looting, but to be fair, they had been in the house for months and the government, both local and federal, weren't doing anything to provide relief. The city couldn't even get Comcast, which paid no income tax in this city and has built two large buildings to give residents free Wi-Fi. What I saw people coming out of these stores on that strip were soap, diapers, formula. A number of the black businesses on that block had not been touched. So when the helicopter began to circle, we kept standing. Some people began playing music. Most people were just standing around and talking. I'm not sure how the fire on the corner in the pharmacy started. I'm not sure who opened the pharmacy, 
the pharmacy stores. But what I do remember is people rushing into the store and then suddenly a fire truck pulled up. Directly after the fire truck pulled up, two SWAT trucks sped down the street and stopped on the corner. I would like to pause here and remind folks that we had no verbal warning that tear gas or other quote unquote non-lethal munitions were going to be deployed. We were standing there waiting to see what was happening, making sure no harm came to the bookstore. And suddenly a SWAT officer gets out and aims the tear gas canister deployment device, whatever, um, at us. Without warning, he shot one into the air and the other directly at um, those of us who were standing up against the wall. I could not run the canister immediately and felt the sting of tear gas in my lungs and eyes. I sped down an adjacent block where my friend lived and went into their department apartment um, and began making sure all of us were okay and unharmed, tended to them, and then washed my own eyes out um, to get my sight back from the tear gas. Once the initial thing went away, we went back outside to check on others who were outside, who were outside the store with us. As we made our way down the block, we told the older folks who had been sitting on their porches to go inside close and close their windows because we were sure that more tear gas and SWAT cars were going to be coming around. As I continue to reflect on the weight of that experience, I am reminded of how some years ago, folks on Osage Avenue must have felt. These kinds of super violent attacks help no one especially when a community is consistently underserved and has to rely on itself to stay safe. My hope is that not only does this never happen again, but that Philadelphia's government would no longer support increasing a police budget that allows things like swap cars and tear gas guns to be purchased before its citizens have schools that function properly, affordable housing, affordable and accessible health care, and all of its other immediate needs. By supporting this bill, you take the first necessary steps in making Philadelphia better for all of its residents. Thank you. Thank you so much. Who's the next witness, Ms. Williams? Dr. Joseph Waduko. Doctor? Good morning. Um, I'd like to begin by thanking you. Well, it is afternoon. That's true. Good afternoon. <laughs> I'd like to begin by thanking Councilwoman, Councilwoman Gim for the invitation to speak on the matter to this committee. I'm an internal medicine physician and health policy researcher currently practicing here in Philadelphia and bring several years of experience working with Black patients and immigrants in this city and nationally. The Council has heard numerous testimonies from residents, particularly those who have been affected by pepper spray, tear gas, and kinetic energy munitions. And I wish to add a new medical perspective to contextualize what they've, they have experienced. Let's start with tear gas. Tear gas comes in various forms, ranging from CS, CS2, and OC, but they all work via the common mechanism. They irritate bodily surfaces and most commonly create unpleasant side effects, including tearing, skin irritation, mild respiratory distress, nausea, headache, and sore throat. These effects can last from 30 minutes to 24 hours. These are the better known side effects. What is less known are the severe, longer lasting, and life-threatening ones. Remember, these are irritants, and if they get deep enough into human tissue or are released in high concentrations, they can cause deeper, more severe injury. Patients can sustain substantial skin burns and dangerous blood pressure elevations. <clears throat> these agents can cause permanent eye damage leading to glaucoma, and blindness. Airways can swell shut, causing patients to have life-threatening respiratory distress. Other patients have been known to sustain liver damage, requiring acute medical attention. Swell swelling of the lungs themselves is a known side effect, known to lead to intensive care admissions. Worse still are the effects of these chemicals reach people that already have comorbidities. If patients already have asthma, as 19% of Philadelphians do, it can provoke a dangerous asthma attack. If patients already have high blood pressure, which nearly half of Black Philadelphians do, they can provoke serious and car cardiac and brain injury. I'll note that there is no true medical antidote for exposure. Our only real treatment is to separate patients from the exposure itself. As we pointedly learned last week, these chemicals stay in neighborhoods long after police leave. 
They can penetrate the homes of neighbors and bystanders, including children who are physically closer to the ground and are at great risk. These chemicals can get caught on clothes and stay for long periods of time, kicking off cycle after cycle of repetitive injury. They can also be injurious to first responders and healthcare providers. In one case, a patient need, needed emergent surgery for a dog bite wound after being exposed to CS tear gas 10 hours earlier. After the procedure, right when he was getting disconnected from the ventilator, the patient's throat began to suddenly close, raising the stakes for quick and safe airway protection. During the reintubation procedure, the anesthesiologist performing the procedure began to be so affected by the tear gas himself that he struggled to place the tube back the patient's throat and had to call for help from another anesthesiologist who also became affected. This was 10 hours after exposure, mind you. While the patient survived, his life was still at sustained risk because his own caretakers were overcome from secondhand exposure. Let's turn our attention to kinetic, kinetic energy munitions, all, otherwise known as rubber bullets. I ask the committee to not let the term rubber mislead you. They're not live ammunition, but they contain metal or plastic cores surrounded by rubber. Okay. Uh, yeah. Your panel is about to begin. We need you to uh, mute. Please mute your mic. Um, Monica, please yeah. mute your mic. The please. muzzle velocity is similar to live ammunition, and targets can sustain severe in injuries similar to those of live ammunition. The shot at close enough range, they have a possibility of breaking skin. If they hit the wrong site, they do have the possibility of causing severe injury. As you heard last week, they might not always hit extremities. They can hit patients in the head, the neck, the torso, and the abdomen. 91%, 91% of the impacts away from the extremities cause severe injuries. Dr. Rohini Har, the University of California at Berkeley, conducted a review of all of the studies done of kin um, kinetic projectile injuries. The just 1,800 people captured in these studies, at least 53 people have died from injuries from rubber bullets, mostly at the head or neck. 300 of them sustained permanent injuries, uh, largely by inducing blindness. I'll emphasize that. These are not less than lethal mechanisms. Even despite the best of efforts, kinetic injury munitions are notoriously difficult to aim. Like tear gas, there are multiple instances of rubber bullets injuring bystanders instead of protesters. This is very spring, a photojournalist in Minneapolis, Linda Torado, was shot in the eye and had to receive surgery and will likely be blinded as a result of kinetic injury at a protest. Eye injuries are particularly concerning to the medical community and a number of national medical associations, including the American Academy of Ophthalmology, American Academy of Family Physicians, and the American College of Surgeons, have called for kinetic injury munitions to be banned because in the words, protesters shouldn't have to choose between their vision and their voice. The horrors that we were told by citizens already understate how physical and mental health can be endangered when protesters and non-protesters alike come into contact with tear gas and rubber bullets. I hope this testimony has brought context to explain why that is so. The size and the impact of this exposure literally classify these as public, as public health risks. I want to understate that this is uh, I take this to be no small matter. I respect the officials who day after day place their lives in the line to guard our inhabitants around the clock. However, I also understand that the tools that are employed in the pursuit of such, such safety can have life-threatening effects of their own. When combined with the already present comorbidities prevalent among citizens in our city, the, to the toxicities can become unbearable. With that said, I request that the committee pass bill number 200-538. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony, Ms. Williams. Anyone else on this panel? That completes this panel, and I don't see any requests for questions in the chat box. Are there any requests, once again, for questions of this panel? Council Chairman, I just wanted to express my gratitude to the panelists, uh, Dr. Wajuko. I think you laid out very clearly um, some of the concerns that we had. I think the, you know, there's a lot of ongoing questions about uh, training and other types of issues. Clearly, even under trained circumstances, there's questions about the use and deployment of rubber bullets, certainly the statistics and, and what we actually saw 
occur and happen with uh, rubber bullets, including hitting people in the head and um, other areas, causing permanent scarring and other damage, um, is borne out by uh, your research. And I just want to express my gratitude and thank you very much to all the testifiers as well. Thank you. I, I echo your um, thanks to them, whether it's morning or afternoon, we're, we're appreciative of their patience. Um, without any other questions of these panels, I will ask, is there anyone that is not called upon that wishes to um, testify on this resolution? There is a second panel, um, councilman, to testify on this bill. Um, Not the bill. Council oh, the bill. I'm sorry. Yes. Mr. Chairman, before yes. we go to the second panel, may I be recognized? Yes, you can. Member Thomas. I'm sorry about that, and I'm, uh, I apologize, Madam Clerk. I just wanted to take a minute to say thank you, too, to the witnesses for testifying, um, specifically the witnesses that talked about having to be out there that day and to experience um, some of the trauma and um, you know, the continued level of distress that we already know exists currently. Um, I just wanted to say thank you to them for sharing their story. I know it's not easy, um, but to also say, you know, on behalf of the city of Philadelphia, I know they've heard it a number of times. I know other council members have said it, but I too wanted to apologize and offer my condolences because, um, you know, I, I, I was out there for a little while. I know um, how scary it was and, you know, um, yep. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just wanted to say that. And again, I apologize, Mr. Clerk, for interrupting you. Thank you, Member Thomas, for being on that front line. I remember those those hours that turned into days and that uncertainty of being out on those streets. And we thank you as well. Um, Ms. Williams, will you please bring up the next panel to testify? Yes, we have um, Monica Allison, Troy Wilson, and Dr. Elizabeth Bosch. Um, just a reminder, we only have 20 minutes left in this hearing, and we do need to have time to actually have a vote on the bill. Um, so if we could keep testimony brief. Ms. Williams, I will ask you to be our official timekeeper and gatekeeper. All right, please state your name for the record and feel free to abbreviate your testimony so that we can take action on this bill. Good afternoon, council members. My name is Monica Allison. I'm a committee person in the third ward, co-founder of the Neighborhood Association, Cops Creek Neighbors, and a longtime resident of West Philadelphia. And the, um, my testimony on October 7th brought all of these hats together. So I'm here today to support council member Gim's legislation to ban the police use of so-called lethal um, less lethal munitions as a response to our demonstrations. Um, being involved in um, civic life my entire adult life, I've taken parts in meetings, writing letters, and yes, peaceful demonstrations. The sets of events on 52nd Street was out of control and harmful from a community perspective. While most of us understand that the looting and rioting was an undesired outcome of peaceful protests and the police needed the flexibility to respond, their over-the-top response was very concerning for the neighborhoods. The rights of citizens to peacefully protest under the First Amendment and is a core portion of our democracy. And as we saw in the events of late May and early June, law enforcement sometimes violates those rights through crackdowns, mass arrests, and illegal use of force in the case impeded, in this case, impeded the rights of the residents who actually pay their taxes. Tear gas does not belong in residential neighborhoods, nor should it be used in a city. It is reserved for military and war zone use, and Philadelphia is not one. Protesters and residents alike were unarmed, but they were tear gassed with no resolve and no regard for the effects of the tear gas on children, those with breathing issues, and in particular, our senior citizens. The police have an arsenal of other options to contain or disperse the crowd if that was the intent. Community policing and de-escalation training, according to the captains in our district, has been a priority and should continue to be so. As residents and neighbors, which includes the officers that serve our areas, 
should have conversations within the police advisory councils as to more appropriate responses for citizens' rights to peacefully protest. The response from the police during this protest pushed a further wedge between the police and the citizens they serve. And let's be clear, the job of the police is not just law enforcement, but it's also service to the community. Philadelphia is the cradle of democracy, and as such, we should be able to uphold the rights of its citizenry as well as enforce the law. It's my hope and the hope of the residents of West Philadelphia that police are held accountable for actions that further damage the very fabric of the city. And this legislation is one step in the right direction. So thank you, Council Member Gim, for shedding the light on this important issue and crafting legislation and language that protects the citizens of Philadelphia. With the help of the other city council members and the mayor, this legislation should become law and our city can begin in the healing process. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your testimony. I remember it from the listening session two weeks ago. Thank you so much for testifying again. Ms. Williams, who's next? Troy Wolfen. Ms. Good, Lewis, good afternoon. Good. Good afternoon, Councilman. Good afternoon, Councilwoman Jim. Uh, I want to first take time very quickly to thank you both for allowing me to testify today in my capacity uh, as an attorney, as a civil rights attorney, as a member of this community, as a long tenured criminal defense attorney, and as a chair, former chairperson of the Philadelphia Bar Association's criminal justice section, and as an occasional fellow protester myself against injustice and police brutality. Um, in my capacity as a civil rights attorney and as a black man, I know all too well how important it is that the appropriate and proper legal and constitutional checks and balances be in place to both stem the tide of wanton and unchecked police aggression while simultaneously seeking to protect citizens from said wanton and unchecked police aggression, especially as it relates to protesters who have conducted themselves in a peaceful manner, as was the case in, say, for example, June of 2020 with the George Floyd protests. I'm here to testify today to demand that City Council immediately pass Councilwoman Gim's City Ordinance Chapter 10-2500 entitled Less Lethal Devices. This ordinance became a necessity because of the actions of members of the Philadelphia Police Department during the protests and in the summertime when multiple videos showed police needlessly deploying tear gas, white smoke, and pepper spray on peaceful protesters, all of whom were not posing any sort of threat to the police whatsoever. Furthermore, many of these innocent protesters were simply attempting to seek refuge from the tear gas, white smoke, and pepper spray, but were unable to do so, thereby further endangering these protesters. Ironically, these protesters were out en masse, peacefully protesting against the continuing scourge of police brutality that has been disproportionately propagated against black people in Philadelphia and throughout this country. And these protesters were met with unprovoked police brutality, thereby confirming both the legitimacy and necessity of these protests. The needless acts of the police against these protesters underscores the necessity of the forthwith passage of this ordinance, since passage of this ordinance is just another tool to ensure that the Philadelphia Police Department is held accountable to all law-abiding citizens. Additionally, it must be emphasized that this ordinance will seek to do what the Philadelphia Police Department has failed to do, protect and serve all that they come into contact with. Equally as important is the fact that the acts of the police were in direct contravention to the Philadelphia Police Department's own internal rules and regulations, as well as the state and federal First Amendment constitutional rights relating to freedom of expression of the protesters. Amnesty International USA uh, conducted a wide-ranging report on these types of George Floyd protests, chronicling what it said were 125 instances of police violence against protesters, journalists, medics, and legal observers in 40 states and Washington, D.C. in both May and June. The group accused police of mishandling a litany of less lethal devices, including tear gas, sting ball grenades, rubber pellets, uh, and the like. Amnesty and other reform-minded groups have called for the immediate development of national guidelines 
as it relates to the specific use by police of less lethal projectiles. These projectiles should be independently tested for accuracy and safety, and they should be used only in situations of violent disorder in which no less extreme measures are sufficient to stop. This report underscores the importance of passing this ordinance because while Philadelphia City Council lacks the inherent power to pass an ordinance compelling the implementation of national guidelines related to the use of non-lethal projectiles, the passage of this ordinance will attempt to utilize City Council's power to limit or discontinue the use of less lethal devices by the Philadelphia Police Department because the department has itself mishandled its right to do so. Finally, I would assume that the decision on passage of this important ordinance should be easy to make in light of the fact that Philadelphia's own police commissioner has in the press publicly apologized for the illegal and unconstitu unconstitutional use of non-lethal projectiles on innocent bystanders by members of our own police force here in Philadelphia. The fourth with support of this ordinance will send a clear and unequivocal message to the world that the city of Philadelphia will take any and every measure to protect its citizens who peacefully protest and will concomitantly protect the First Amendment constitutional rights of protesters against any unnecessary police aggression, especially when they attempt to use non-lethal devices to quell legal and peaceful protests. And to sum up, hopefully this passage of this ordinance will not only protect citizens from needless and unnecessary police aggressions against peaceful protesters, but it will also remind police that they are supposed to be trained to de-escalate situations when they encounter the public, or in this specific case, peaceful pro pro protesters who are cloaked in the protection of the state and federal constitutional rights to freely join together to exercise their freedom of speech against an entity that has, for far too many years, shown the public that it still needs to work on learning how to react in a non-aggressive way towards peaceful protesters so as to avoid unnecessary injuries to these very same protesters. Thank you very much for allowing me the opportunity to testify on such a very important matter. And I want to thank Councilman Gim for putting together this ordinance. I think it's very important. We need to do everything we can in our power to stem the tide of unwanted and unwanted police aggression. Thank you so much for your testimony. Ms. Williams, are there any other witnesses to testify on this bill? Yes, uh, Dr. Elizabeth Bob. Uh, we, have, we have exactly 10 minutes. Please feel free to abbreviate your testimony. Uh, thank you, Councilman. I will make it as short as possible and I really appreciate the chance to speak. Um, so I had also uh, testified at the meeting two weeks ago, um, specifically about being a physician and a pediatrician who was called in to help with the medical treatment of those who were affected by the tear gas and the rubber bullets. You may remember specifically treating a family who had been attacked in their own home with small children that were suffering from tear gas exposure. So uh, as a pediatrician, I would like to reflect on the larger um, implications of that uh, experience as a microcosm into the negative impacts that uh, these so-called less than lethal uh, weapons can have. So as a pediatrician, I was especially horrified at this indiscriminate use of a chemical weapon on these children. Um, as we've heard, the use of tear gas as a chemical, we chemical weapon has been banned in warfare situations under the Geneva Protocol nearly 100 years ago. And then it was specifically banned again by the United Nations Chemical Weapons Convention in 1997. This really underscores the danger of what is really a chemical weapon, which can, which can have permanent effects even in adults. Tear gas works by activating a pain receptor specifically. That's how it is designed. Um, it actually activates the same pain receptor as wasabi, but it is 100,000 times stronger. So imagine being a small child and having wasabi powder specifically and intentionally blasted into your eyes, multiplied 100,000 times over. These chemicals in, that were only ever formally tested on healthy white male adult volunteers and even in this population, it was found to leave them with long-term higher risks for infections such as influenza, pneumonia, bronchitis, and a whole range of other respiratory illnesses. Of course, this becomes especially relevant as our Black communities in Philadelphia are still disproportionately decimated by COVID-19. 
Our own Center for Disease Control and Prevention has warned that tear gas can blind and kill people through chemical burns and respiratory failure. Just this year, prisoners in the U.S. with respiratory conditions have died after inhaling tear gas in poorly ventilated areas. In addition, we have no data about the effects of tear gas on women and children, but there have been studies already linking it to increased rates of miscarriage. There was a formal study performed in 2017 on over 5,000 patients who were exposed to tear gas. These physicians reported many permanent effects, respiratory problems, mental health effects, blindness, brain injury, loss of the use of limbs, limb amputation, and skin conditions. Adding to the horror of this exposure, there is no effective treatment to remove the other than to remove the substance as quickly as possible. For obvious reasons, the long-term effects of tear gas on children have never been studied, but reports indicate there can be permanent damage to the developing lungs. It is even harder to quantify the psychological trauma for a child to be trapped in their own room surrounded by this noxious chemical weapon. Rubber bullets are similarly dangerous. In a 2009 study, researchers found that rubber bullets can hit with more than twice the force of a professional boxer, which is hard enough to fracture the cadaver skulls they were studying. And remind, remember, these were adult skulls, not to mention what would happen in a pediatric population. There was a study in the British Medical Journey in 2017 that showed that 3% of all rubber bullet victims died and 15% or one in seven were permanently injured. Uh, as mentioned, so many Americans have been blinded already that formal statements have been made asking by medical professionals to ban these weapons. Um, in addition, sociology studies have shown that the, the use of these less than lethal ammunitions are more likely to escalate violence and lead to truly lethal force. And it is clear to anyone who has either personal experience or even a glancing familiarity with this data that the physical and psychological effects of these less than lethal weapons are clearly significant, all the more so for the sensitive developing brains and lungs of children and babies and on the minority populations which they are disproportionately deployed. Thank you so much for your time. Councilman, you're on mute. And for the record, Ms. Williams, you muted. <laughs> I did. My bad. I'm sorry. Uh, um, <laughs> are, there, are there any other witnesses to testify on bill number 200-538? There are no other witnesses to testify, Mr. Chairman. Are there any others of the committee that wish to comment on said bill? Mr. Uh, Chairman, I just want to express my gratitude to um, to Monica, Shakira, um, and Dr. Baj, uh, who are out there. Um, I know how difficult your testimony was. We are we will be thinking of you as we move this bill forward as well as many of our other Philadelphians. Um, Dr. Wajuko and uh, Ms. Lopez and Mr. Wilson, uh, thank you so much also for your powerful testimony as well and for bringing clarity and accountability and justice to this to this policy conversation. But thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Member Gim. Hearing no others to testify, this concludes our public hearing. We will now go into our public meeting. We will take a minute to allow the witnesses to disconnect so that we can conduct our business on the bill. We will now go into our public meeting of the committee of uh, Public safety on bill number 200538. And the chair recognizes Councilman Johnson for a motion on the bill. Um, Councilman, if I could just call roll again, I need to make sure we still have a quorum um, before we take vote. Would you, um, could you please call the roll? Thank you. Is Councilmember Thomas still with us? Okay, well, since Councilwoman Present. Brooks uh, turned sorry, her camera Councilman on, Thomas I think in Council. Okay, great. I think we have a quorum now. Um, you can proceed.
Okay, the chair, now, the chair now recognizes Councilman Johnson uh, for a motion on the bill. Councilman Johnson. If, the, if he is not there, can I ask the um, author of the bill for the motion. Yes, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I move that bill number 200538 be reported from this committee with a favorable recommendation and further move that the rules of council be suspended to permit first reading of this bill at the next session of council. Second. It, is in, it has been moved and properly seconded that bill number 200538 be moved from this committee with a favorable recommendation and further move that the rules of council be suspended to allow first reading of this bill at our next session of council. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, the ayes have it. Uh, bill number 200, which one, seven? Come on, what's the number? Uh, 200538 has been moved from this committee. Um, and with that, this concludes the business of the Public Safety Committee. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, for your stewardship. And thank you, you to all of my colleagues. Minute. You still have another minute. You can give uh, closing comments. No, I just wanted to express my gratitude to the Public Safety Committee. Um, I felt like this has been a committee that's taken on issues that far exceed sometimes our, uh, you know, sometimes uh, so, uh, has has had us confront issues uh, that are overwhelming at times, whether it's violence um, within our own communities, reforming of institutions. But I just want to express gratitude um, for this committee for its stalwart stalwart work in making sure that we both can hear the voices of our residents, um, that we can work with our uh, department agencies, uh, that we can see a chance for healing, um, as has been said before, but uh, just expressing gratitude to the whole committee and to my colleagues. Thank you. I, re I read the article on the freshman four, uh, and you're the older advisor or more senior, not a senior advisor to them. So uh, we appreciate you guys and, and your contribution to the city of Philadelphia's public policy. Thank you all. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, colleagues. Thank you, everyone.